Hello everyone. I am finally sitting down to do a video that I have been wanting to do for quite some time. I am going to be ranking all 62 Walt Disney Animation Studios feature films. These are all of the films that are considered canon Walt Disney Animated Studio feature films. So there are multiple divisions uh, of dividing up the Walt Disney uh, Studios uh, empire of the Disney company. Uh, and there are two primary animation divisions within the company. We have Walt Disney Animation Studios and we have Pixar. Pixar is another video, uh, a different animation studio that got bought and acquired by Disney in 2006. They had a distribution deal through Disney before then uh, for their earlier films. I will make a separate video ranking Pixar films in the hopefully not too distant future. But uh, Walt Disney Animation Studios still survives to this day. And alongside Pixar, they put out at least one film a year. That's been usually how they've been running for especially the last 30 years. Uh, occasionally they skip a year and then maybe put out two in one year. That's happened a couple times in the last 30 years, but usually it's about one a year. Uh, oftentimes they've been releasing in the last uh, 20 years around Thanksgiving, where Pixar takes more of the summer slot, though they do swap occasionally. Uh, but Walt Disney Animation Studios has not sent every single film that they've ever made into theaters. But a lot of movies uh, that are not sent to theaters are actually made by a different division of Walt Disney Animation called Disney Toon Studios, which opened in the 90s with, I believe, a movie in 1990 uh, with the movie DuckTales, the movie Treasure of the Lost Lamp. And since that time, they've made predominantly uh, either direct to VHS slash DVD or streaming now in this day and age. Uh, animated films, usually sequels to films from the main house animation studios. Uh, the Return of Jafar, the Aladdin sequel, was the first of these uh, direct-to-VHS at the time, uh, direct-to-DVD at-home release uh, sequels. I will not be reviewing any of those films, even though some of them did release in theaters, Jungle Book 2, Return to Neverland. Some of them did get theatrical releases, but they were not made from Walt Disney Animation Studios proper. They were from Disney Toon Studios. So you won't see any of those films in this list. There are also some interesting collaborations between Walt Disney Pictures, which is the live action division, Walt Disney Film Studios, of the film division, with Walt Disney Animation Studios. Uh, the first collaboration uh, between the two was The Reluctant Dragon in 1941. Uh, films of this caliber would be like Mary Poppins, uh, and um, Enchanted. These are movies that include live action scenes, but also mix in some animation as well, usually where they have live action people interacting with animated characters. That could be a separate ranking video. Um, the Nightmare Before Christmas from Tim Burton and Henry Selleck is also considered in that category. Uh, I don't know why it's not considered in the proper in-house uh, animation studio, Legacy, um, as it is entirely animated, but, but for some reason that film is never considered canonically a part of the now 62 films that span the Walt Disney Animated Features canon, feature film canon. Uh, and that, of course, starts with 1937's Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, and will come all the way to 2023's Wish, the latest entry in that legacy. Um, now, what is interesting is uh, there are a set of films called the Package Films, which are anthology animated shorts that are packaged together that were released in the 1940s uh, that are considered canonically part of Walt Disney Animation Studios' theatrical film, film canon. Um, they do feature some live action uh, performance, uh, though not as much as a Mary Poppins or The Reluctant Dragon or Song of the South, where that's more the forefront. The animation is very much the forefront of these films, which makes them different from films that have a bit of animation sort of as a little segment in them, or maybe one character that's animated, but then there's live action throughout almost the entire film. So I think that's why these war package uh, anthology animated films are considered part of Walt Disney Animation's proper instead of a collaboration between Walt Disney Pictures and the animation studio. So with all of that out of the way, uh, I debated on going in and doing a bit of a deep dive into the history of the Walt Disney Company, uh, which of course was founded by Walt Disney in 1923. Now it has celebrated its centennial last year, and of course, 
Um, in that time, they've put out, as I said, 62 uh, theatrically released animated films that have, some of them are sequels, but most are originals. Uh, and Walt Disney was very strong, uh, was very emphatic about not being a fan of sequels. Boy, has the company changed course. Uh, Walt Disney has a lot of problematic things about him, but you can say one thing you can't knock is that he was not afraid to be a visionary for the arts. And you definitely see a lot more trepidation on these big mega companies today uh, in being afraid to try out new IP that could be a little bit, you know, that could be a risk financially. Um, and Walt put so much of his own money into these early films, you know, Snow White, Pinocchio, that if they if they bombed, his own house was financed, uh, his whole life savings. It wasn't just the studio, it was him. Uh, and you don't see CEOs today uh, putting down their own houses to finance these films. So there's a risk that, you know, obviously no one wants to take because it could go south. But I think the risks are in the grand scheme of the Disney story. What makes Disney succeed today as such a legacy, iconic American company and a Hollywood staple for not just children's entertainment, but all film cinema history itself for adults as well. I want to preface this video by saying I have a real affinity for the Disney animation brand. I have a an affinity for the Disney company as a whole, but obviously any sort of mega company like that is inherently a little bit, you know, shady in how it's structured and in how it conducts its uber capitalistic measures. I'll get into it in this video, issues I might have with the Disney company. This video is going to be specifically about Disney animation and how I think that they are definitely not being, I don't know if they're necessarily being led in the right direction currently. And there have been periods, uh, there have been highs and there have been lows where the company has really struggled and then seen real success. And a lot of the time it was kind of unexpected. Uh, so I really do think that they don't always learn their lessons and they try to replicate success and then it starts to become tedious and they don't try breaking new ground. They need fresh blood in there. They need people who really are willing to move the company forward, uh, adapt it to current day, current times, while also straddling that nostalgia line. It's a difficult line to, line to straddle. A lot of us think of Disney as our childhood. And as a 90s child myself, uh, I am 30 years old. I grew up on Disney movies. A lot of these movies are extremely special and nostalgic for me. A bunch of them may be a little bit more highly revered than others who didn't grow up with them. Uh, and I found that with other people. I've watched a lot of different Disney ranking videos on this channel, particularly for the animation studio. And it, partly why I wanted to do this was because I wanted to see, I saw several films getting consistently knocked by most critics and reviews. And I realized that I think a lot of these people didn't grow up watching them. And I think that really does affect your affinity for the film. Uh, and I'll admit that obviously this is a subjective list. I am not trying to come across as this objective, this is the definitive list and ranking that everyone should agree with. This is my own personal ranking. Uh, I do take into account critical acclaim. I do take into account what other people are saying about films. But by and large, at the end of the day, the biggest factor that comes into why I'm ranking the films the way I'm ranking them is my own personal affinity or preference for them. Some of these films, I'm going to preface this by saying, are going to be a lot lower than y'all would like. But that's the nature of the game. I got to rank 62 movies here. Uh, and that means I'm finally going to maybe shed some like love on films that I consistently see others putting in the bottom 10. And I'm like, I kind of get where they're coming from. But at the end of the day, I cannot put them below a certain point because of how much nostalgia I have imbued for them. Now, there are a couple of films that don't pass that test uh, that as an adult, I fully kind of see through. But a lot of them I still am enraptured by. And I will have to work on disentangling myself from that. I'm trying to balance subjectivity and objectivity here. But I just wanted to preface that. There are a lot of films that everyone seems to like to collectively dunk on. And I want this video to be a little bit of an answer to that. But going off of that, I really do, and we're seeing so much discourse today about how Disney has lost its way. I think both people, both sides, either the ultra conservative or the side of, I would argue, left-leaning cine cinephile lovers, art film lovers, 
both sides are kind of at odds with Disney right now. And Bob Iger is not doing the best job at quelling either side. And it puts Disney in a difficult spot. Um, Bob Iger is the current CEO. He has been the head of the company since 2006. I definitely think it is time for him to go. Uh, he was supposed to leave in 2020, uh, but Bob Chapek, well, in 2019, Bob Chapek, Chapek was selected as his successor. And then back in not even two years, uh, actually barely even a year and a half into Bob Chapek's uh, heading of the company, did Bob Iger swoop back in and say, hold on, this ain't working. I'm so sorry, but uh, you picked, I picked the wrong Bob to steer the ship. Uh, so you got the battle of the Bobs. Uh, and I agree that Bob Chapek did a worse job, even though he didn't have a lot of time at the company. Uh, Bob Chapek was the one who really was at the forefront of Disney Plus. And he came into power right as Disney Plus launched. And a lot of the streaming decisions that were made in the pandemic were his call that I think definitely impacted the Disney reputation, particularly the box office of its animated and animated film houses like Pixar and its animation studio. So there's a lot to unpack here, but I will say I'm not going to be one of these people who is here to just completely dunk on modern Disney. I do think there is still magic in the House of Mouse. Uh, there's just unfortunately a lot of trepidation about um, doing things that they've done in the past that push the envelope. And I do think that there's a little bit of creative slump. Um, there's there's not as much uh, there's. There's not as much creative. Uh, they're retreading a lot of similar tropes and ideas. And their latest film is the most uh, kind of uh, representative of that. We'll talk about it when I get to Wish. Um, but, you know, again, I, 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 I have nuanced takes on Disney. I, I feel at the end of the day that most of the movies that I'm going to be talking about, these are movies that not only define my childhood, but define something so innocent and magical and wondrous about you know, people watching films in the earlier stages of development. Um, there's such a captivating magic to Disney movies, and I'm so grateful that they exist. And they are the first ever animation studio feature film house. So you just got to give props to the magic that Disney has imbued into the world. And I will always buy into it. Um, I am very sappy. I love the sappy romances. I love the wedding cake kind of fairy tale movies and that aesthetic. And I like it when it's done well, uh, but, you know, I think that there's something about majestic music, beautiful songwriting, beautiful, beautiful animation. A lot of these films, it is just so many stills could be hanging in museums, especially if you watch them in high definition. And I love seeing them getting remastered and just them having such a staying power as just such beautiful works of art. Um, animation is hand-drawn animation in particular. I'm sticking with hand-drawn. You know, CGI has its merits, but uh, I will definitely touch on this in the video. The, the dropping of hand-drawn animation, not just in Disney, but in all major animation studios in the West, is something that is so tragic uh, in, the two, in the 21st century. And perhaps we are going to see a shift uh, perhaps finally in the other direction as uh, apparently Walt Disney Animation Studios is starting to hire on a couple more 2D animation uh, 2D illustrators. Uh, slowly, they're kind of building up those uh, those offices and those, uh, those studios that got shuttered down in the 2000s. Uh, even in the late 90s, they started axing a lot of their uh, 2D animation staff um, as they saw the, the winds of change coming from Pixar and what they were doing. Um, so I'm not necessarily here to dump entirely on CGI, but I do think CGI has done well for certain things. And I think hand-drawn has its own benefits that the, t the execs of today do not see worth the investment. And I think that's very sad, especially considering they are what built this company. Once Upon a Studio, I have to talk about before I get too far into this video, because Once Upon a Studio was just released. Um, and I won't be talking about it in this ranking because it is a short film from Walt Disney Animation. Uh, but uh, it is so much more in some ways indicative of what I think Disney should be celebrating than Wish was, even though Wish is all about the Disney magic of celebrating all of its past films. But Once Upon a Studio is much more, I think, feeling a little fresher and more like the spirit of the actual original uh, studio um, instead of, you know, this sort of sanitized, overly corporate kind of product that we're being fed, you know, 
uh, by what we're coming out of the animation studio today. Um, and so Once Upon a Studio was such a joy to watch. It was very emotional to see all these characters that we've grown up and loved interacting together. It was truly a dream come true to see. And I'm so glad it was made. I love just all those characters showing up and, and the way they could be interacting. I wish it was longer um, in the Roy Disney Animation Studio building in Burbank, California as the setting. And all these portraits, all these, uh, you know, beloved characters of the last 85 years coming together for um, a big family class portrait uh, to celebrate 100 years of the studio. And I just wanted to give a shout out because if you haven't seen it, it is absolutely the right kind of fan service uh, that makes you think, gosh, you know, Disney still could be great. Uh, if only they could tap into that spirit again. With all of that preface out of the way, I'll touch on some of the history as I'm going through each film. Uh, that's how I'm going to touch on the history. That's how I've decided to do it. I don't want this video to be eons long, but it probably will be pretty long, knowing me. And so with that, let's begin with number 62. We got to get the worst out of the way first. Let's start with my least favorite Walt Disney animated feature film. Okay, so this is where I could get myself in a little bit of trouble. Obviously, if one's going to make a review of 62 films, one would expect you to have seen all 62 films. Well, this is where I have to admit something. Uh, I have not seen Make My Music. Make My Music is from 1946, and it is one of the package films from the war era. So, the, or it's often called the package era. Um, you could call it either. There's different eras in Disney's history, and I'll be referring to them as I talk about films from those eras. Uh, the war era is the second era of Disney, and it started in the 1940s when, obviously, World War II had broken out, and Disney now had to, obviously, finance, while well, they were on a strict budget, uh, had trouble with financing, but also had to somewhat shift gears into making propaganda pieces for the government. And in amongst all of that, it really stunted what Walt Disney could do. Not to mention he was reeling from he was reeling from the box office failure of Fantasia, which I think is really sad. We'll talk about that with Fantasia. That was one of the hugest, you know, Snow White and Pinocchio paid off. Fantasia did not, and that movie was extremely expensive to make, and it was it was a commercial bomb. Um, kind of in some ways a critical one at the time too, which is only over the decades, gotten finally its critical acclaim. Uh, people just didn't understand it. Walt was ahead of his time. But it's about another movie. Uh, but they were definitely trying to replicate Fantasia in a lot of these package films. And so the idea of stitching together a bunch of little animated shorts and making a package film, which did come out in theaters, uh, was really enticing to the studio in the 1940s. Um, now, the difference is, is that Make My Music is the only film, not only of the war era, but of all of the 62 films that Disney has ever created in the animated sector that is not currently available to stream on Disney Plus and does not, I believe, currently have a Blu-ray release. It does have a DVD, but it does not have a Blu-ray physical release. This film is really hard to get your hands on these days. Uh, there are clips of it on YouTube, and I did watch one short I watched the closing short about the Willie the Whale, who is the opera singer. Uh, the one that is the most iconic and most, I think, well-respected of the shorts. There are about 10 of them in this, in this film. And uh, as we talk more about these package films, you'll see that a bunch of them are filler. Uh, Fantasia doesn't have a lot of filler, but these package films do. Um, and so Make My Music, unfortunately, automatically went to the bottom, mainly because not only had I never seen it, but I was also reading tons of different reviews. I was looking at IMDb. I was looking at Rotten Tomatoes. I was looking at Letterboxd cumulative scoring. And Make My Music does not have a great reputation. Uh, so a lot of people agree that it is one of the worst package films. And especially since most people view the package films as some of the worst of Disney animation, it stands to reason that even if I had seen Make My Music, I would probably put it at the very best at 61, maybe not 62. I find it very hard to believe that it would have gone any higher. So I know to, to Disney purists, it might be a little aggravating that I have not seen this film. But I have to preface that because it is not available to stream on Disney+, Plus, that is the reason why. I do not really have the investing kind of, as much as I love Disney, I don't 
necessarily think it's worth buying this film. Okay. Spending my own money to see it is not something that I really feel is worth my time, especially when I've seen so many people dunk on it critically. And so at the end of the day, that's just kind of where it sits. In some ways, I could say that I'm really ranking 61 films. 62 is just being held by this film that I haven't been able to see in all of its entirety. But shout out to the whale singing at the opera, because there is a charm to it. There is some emotional appeal. The music is strong. That I'm glad I saw. I just, I've never as a kid seen this film. And as an adult, I have no desire to see it either. Um, this isn't, you know, to say that I don't like some of what the war films have to offer. These package films, actually, I didn't go into them all completely skeptical that I wasn't going to enjoy myself. There are some, I was pleasantly surprised by one or two, but a couple of them definitely, the reviews definitely spoke for themselves. So I apologize, but that's what I'm putting at the bottom of this list. Okay, so now we fully get into the films that I have actually seen on Disney Plus or elsewhere um, that I can fully say more confidently and rank where they go. So I suppose you could say the least, my least favorite Disney animated film that I have currently seen is Fun and Fancy Free. This one is from 1947. Um, so a year later, uh, Disney, again, this is right after the war and uh, they're really strapped for cash. I had never seen this film as a kid. I will always preface whether I saw this film as a kid or whether I watched it for the first time as an adult on Disney+. Plus. And this was one of those films I had to go back and do my homework to see because I had no desire to see it as a kid. Um, Jiminy Cricket from Pinocchio makes a surprise appearance, makes an appearance in this one. And of course, of course we also have Mickey Mouse, Donald, and Goofy, staple cartoon characters of the early cartoons of Disney. Um, so it does, the, the plus side of this film, out of the package films, is that instead of being a, a bunch of different stories smushed together, they decide to just focus on two. And I do appreciate them giving two stories rather than a bunch thrown together to give them all a little bit more space to be their own thing. The first story is a, a musical romance story about a bear named Bongo. Um, this is the one with Jiminy Cricket. The bear meets a female bear. They fall in love. It's this classic, you know, 1940s music, you know, decent animation, but it's kind of cheap compared to what you've seen in other more lauded, lauded films of that era from Disney. It's fine, but it's it's not, you know, anything to phone home about. The second, which is a more memorable story, is a story of Jack and the Beanstalk uh, and Mickey and Donald and Goofy. Uh, you know, through the pair, you know, that fairy tale of selling the cow to get a container of magic beans. Uh, as Mickey climbs this giant beanstalk, he comes to a castle that has this giant and he has to hide from it. It's the best part of the film, for, for sure. The Mickey and the Beanstalk portion has actually been packaged as its own film. And if that was the only thing that I was viewing here, I would have rated this a bit higher. But because it's sandwiched amongst other things that are kind of mediocre or a bit cringe, ultimately this film just, and maybe it's because I've only seen it once, but this film just felt bottom to me. It felt like the bottom of what Disney can do. Um, shout out to Mickey and the Beanstalk, but it just doesn't do it. Now, I will say what really drags this film is the live action portion where you have this marionette puppet, the story being told. Um, you know, to a little girl, I, the, 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 the cringiest jokes that are ever put to, put to film, uh, told, it's just so unnecessary, completely ruins the, uh, flow of the film. I believe there are actually cuts of the film that do not include this, this, uh, this narrating, um, commentating puppet, but unfortunately the one on Disney plus does. And that is the film I ultimately had to judge. So that brings so much of this down. So that's why it's at the bottom. You're not missing that much. If you don't see it, maybe see Mickey Mickey on the Beanstalk as its own thing on YouTube. All right. At number 60. A dash of old reaction. And I assume you know the rest. We have Chicken Little from 2005. This is 
Disney's first ever completely computer generated animated film. This comes 10 years after Toy Story. So Pixar had already, you know, broken that ground. And this was right before Pixar was about to be acquired by Disney. This was Michael Eisner's last film. This was uh, what I call the dark era or the slump, but it's considered by canon the post-Renaissance era, the 2000s. Um, Now, I'll admit, I have only seen this film once. And that one time I saw it was when I was 12 years old in a movie theater. I decided not to rewatch it to do this ranking. I was debating it. I just never got around to it. I will probably rewatch it at some point, but there's a reason I'm not drawn to rewatching this film. I don't actually remember it that much. I remember the general story beat, the sky is falling about a chicken who believes that aliens are invading and no one will listen to him. It's basically everyone, including his own father, gaslighting the hell out of this poor guy. Um, I remember that. I remember all the sort of goofy shenanigans. I remember all the pop music needle drops. But this is the quintessential movie of how this does not at all feel like what Disney is. I feel like the fact that I didn't even fully... The fact that Disney is the producer of this movie is really sad to me. This feels like something Dream DreamWorks would have put out. Um, not completely to diss DreamWorks, but DreamWorks, you know, a lot of their output, this is a little bit more in their lane, especially in the 2000s, um, in the mid-2000s when this was coming out. I think Illumination has sort of now taken that badge and has become the very kid-friendly animation studio, whereas DreamWorks still tries to be edgy sometimes. Uh, Illumination is having some hits now, so it's not entirely... Well, Illumination's always been successful, but Illumination had the Super Mario Brothers movie, which actually got some critical love. So Illumination is definitely maybe on the up and up, but... Anywho, Chicken Little does not feel like a Disney movie. It does not have very much to take seriously with the story. Um, And it is god-awful animation. Um, And that definitely doesn't help in terms of rewatchability. What's unfortunate is that this film was a serious financial success for the studio. They had had a lot of box office fails uh, in the years since the Renaissance, and they really needed a win at the box office. And it's really sad if you look at the box office history of the early 2000s at Disney, they were unfortunately getting rewarded for the wrong films. And Chicken Little being such a box office hit sent the wrong message to the studio, which is that 2D animation is out, 3D animation is in. Obviously, Pixar you know, was coming off of The Incredibles and Finding Nemo, and they were doing amazing. Um, And so I understand why they wanted to imitate that success. DreamWorks as well had been doing that already. But it's really sad to see Disney sacrifice so much of what made it special to create lackluster CGI films. And they made several of them in the mid-2000s. So I think Chicken Little is a dark spot in the company's trajectory. This was also right before Bob Iger came in. He actually may have fixed a few things. Michael Eisner, we all forget, Bob Iger doesn't make the best decisions for the creative direction of the company, but Michael Eisner was actually worse. Even though he oversaw the, you know, um, the Renaissance era, which is my favorite era of Disney, the Michael Eisner era That was all Roy Disney. That was all Roy Disney and Jeffrey Katzenberg. Uh, That the rest, and then of course, they both ended up having falling outs with the studio. And that was largely due to Michael Eisner. Um, So don't don't give Michael Eisner too much credit for uh, for the Renaissance. Um, Just like, you know, we have a second Renaissance in the 2010s. I don't give Bob Iger all that credit, though. I think it's just the different creatives that they had hired to head the division. Uh, and so, yeah, that's at the end of the day, what we got here, Chicken Little, I've seen most people put it at the very bottom. I've seen it ranked consistently very low in all of the rankings on Rotten Tomatoes and all of them. So I just, I don't feel like it's unfair for me to place it where I'm placing it. This just, this doesn't feel like a piece of art. This film does not feel like it has any artistic merit, and I don't think it's trying to have any artistic merit, and I think that's what really drags it down for me. I'd rather you at least try, like with Wish, though they didn't try that hard, but they at least tried.
At number 59, we have Saludos Amigos. This is one of the first package films. It was released in 1943. Uh, and it's really a precursor film to a later film called The Three Caballeros, uh, which further expounds upon this idea of Mickey Mouse and co. exploring Latin America, particularly South America. The United States government, the State Department, commissioned Disney to, in, you know, to distract a little bit from what was going on over in Europe, uh, but to also bridge some goodwill uh, with U.S. Central and South America. They wanted Disney to spotlight, uh, almost for like the tourism board, uh, uh, the beauty and diversity of Latin America, which I think is an interesting idea. But of course, it comes across a little problematic when you see all these white men trying to depict Native peoples uh, and their languages. There are some, I think, tactful things done in some of these illustrations, but others, you know, it's the 1940s. You're watching it and you just have to keep that in the back of your mind. Like the, you know, the the, the card that reads before a lot of these films on Disney+. Plus. Um, Saludos Amigos is short. It's one of the shortest. I think it's only 45 minutes. Uh, it's the shortest of the package films. There are four different segments uh, where they visit um, different regions. Um, you know, you have Lake Titicaca uh, and Bolivia and Peru. Um, you have Pedro, um, Pedro, the anthropomorphic plane, who's trying to fly uh, to Chile to get airmail uh, from Mendoza. And he almost makes it, but it's like a storm catches him. It's, it's kind of your rooting for the plane. It's really cute. Uh, you have El Gaucho Goofy. It's an American Western. You get a lot of these kind of Westerns with Goofy playing a cowboy and a bunch of these. They all start to blur together to me and they are not interesting to me at all. Uh, my least favorite part of this package together. And then Aquarela do Brasil is so beautiful. It's like the best part for me as an artist because it is a watercolor kind of uh, hand-drawn um, musical montage of this bird character, Jose Carioca and Donald Duck traveling through Rio de Janeiro and uh, different Brazilian settings and rainforests in this beautiful watercolor painting that just kind of flows through the animation as it's being painted. And it's just absolutely gobs, it's absolutely breathtaking. And so for this part alone, elevates the rest of Saludos Amigos, which for the rest of it is just, again, very make my music fair. I'm the range. Really Home on the Range. This was a bomb of a film that I actually, from again, the Chicken Little era, that I never saw as a kid, which kind of blew the minds of some people I knew were similar, similar in age to me. Um, I think it was probably for the best that I never saw this film as a kid because I certainly wasn't missing out on very much. Uh, Home on the Range, I have seen at the bottom of a lot of people's lists. It's either Chicken Little or Home on the Range. It's interesting how these two movies came out uh, about a year apart from each other. Uh, un unfortunately, Home on the Range has the sad asterisk of being one of the last fully 2D animated films. Um, actually, Winnie the Pooh in 2011 is, uh, but they did take a break from 2D for several years before they finally did two last gasps with it. Um, and I'm glad that Home on the Range isn't the final nail in the coffin for 2D animation, which actually, to be fair, animation-wise, this film is actually pretty beautiful. The landscapes of the American West are done in a very beautiful style. Um, the colors really pop. Uh, so to be honest with you, I went in fully expecting Home on the Range to be even worse than Chicken Little. But after having watched it, I was a little bit, I was a little surprised to see how much hate it would get. I do think at the end of the day, it's a film I have no desire to see again. Um, the, the, you know, the characters, the humor, it's geared, it's very much geared to little children. There's very, I mean, there is something adults can enjoy about it, but it's just a silly cow yard, cow escapade romp. Uh, and the villain, it all feels very kind of, it's, it's basically, you know, some of those gaucho, uh, some of those Western shorts we see in the package films made into a full-length film. I'm not even a big Western fan myself. It's just not a genre and a setting that I have such a proclivity towards. But I'm open-minded to it when it's done right. And this this film, it doesn't have a lot of memorable music. I do believe, you know, it had some um, Bonnie Raitt, Bonnie Raitt, Tim McGraw, 
So it has some country heavyweights composing for the soundtrack, but it's not a musical. Uh, I mean, the four, the three leading ladies of Roseanne Barr, Judy Dench, and Jennifer Tilly are the stars. Um, they definitely, you know, are their own characters, and they have some comedic parts that made me laugh. But at the end of the day, I just felt like I was watching a movie that is for very little children that has absolutely no business being released in theaters. Um, it definitely feels like a direct-to-DVD kind of Disney film. I'd be surprised that this didn't come out of Disney Toon Studios. Okay, so we have Melody Time at number 57. Uh, Melody Time, I think, is trying the hardest, along with Make My Music, trying the hardest to really copy Fantasia. This is from 1948. It's just a slightly longer version of Make My Music. Um, and it packs a lot into uh, the package here, anthologies. We've got things like uh, one of my favorites, which is um, The Legend of Johnny Appleseed. Uh, now, you know, it's interesting. I don't, with the exception of one of these package films, I didn't really watch any of these as a kid. But when I rewatched this one, uh, you know, within the last year to prep for this video on Disney+, Plus, I started to think maybe I'd seen at least some of it because I sort of remember seeing The Legend of Johnny Appleseed uh, as a child. But, um, you know, it's the one of the more traditional narrative stories. Uh, and, you know, on its own as a short, it's actually pretty decent. Um, John Chapman is, you know, a figure of Midwestern United States folklore and history. Uh, plant an apple tree, apple trees, and they take it through that kind of a mythological, mytho mythologize his story in a very Disney fashion, which I enjoy. Um, I also really like trees. Uh, you know, it's a recitation of a poem by Joyce Kilmer. Uh, featuring some gorgeous orchestral music. And it's very much in the spirit of Fantasia, where, you know, animation and uh, music are synced, synced up together to stir up an emotion. And there doesn't need to be a strong narrative. One of the big proponents that I have of these kinds of films over some people who are very narrative focused is that I don't think animation always needs a super strong narrative. I think animation for animation's sake can be just as beautiful and emotively stirring. And so I think that some of these shorts, although some may find them boring or dull, I find really, really beautiful and really, really showing what I wish we get so much more of Disney from today. Uh, Pico's Bill is uh, another Texas Western, um, and it at least doesn't feature Goofy. Um, it's, it's cute. It's kind of silly. Um, this also features uh, some live action shots of Roy Rogers, Bob Nolan, uh, and Don Bobby Driscoll. You know, they're telling the story at their, uh, you know, Oregon Trail wagon, um, talking about the Wild West. And let me tell you a yarn. Um, it's corny. And it doesn't do much for me. Once Upon a Winter Time is beautiful as well. Just a, a beautiful, whimsical, um, romantic story of two lovers figure skating and then, you know, uh, then suddenly having to rescue Jenny as she starts getting swept away by the ice. Um, so yeah, little toot. It's got some, it's got some heart to it. Uh, it definitely is trying. Um, maybe, you know, obviously limited by budget constraints, as you can tell. Um, perhaps a bit rushed in, ex in execution. Uh, it's far from perfect. It definitely feels like it needs to be in this kind of level of placement. But I don't, I don't believe that it's worse than Fun and Fancy Free or Saludos Amigos. I, I feel that, or even Make My Music, um, even though, again, I haven't seen that. Uh, so I'll be interested when I finally do, do see it, which I prefer. But they're both poor man's versions of Fantasia and also Fantasia 2000, which is still, at least in terms of budget, a bit more of an event than these films are. Okay, so now we start to get to potentially some controversial territory. At 56, we have 2008's Bolt. Uh, this, of course, has um, Miley Cyrus and John Travolta. Uh, Miley playing the, the human, you know, owner of the dog who loses him. A uh, dog voiced by John Travolta. Uh, I never saw this film until recently for research for this video. Uh, I was in high school at the time. I wasn't really as paying much attention to what Disney was doing. I'm going to be completely honest at that point. So uh, I'd heard of it, but I never had any desire to watch it. 
it's definitely, you know, uh, like a superhero dog story. The the beginning of the movie, I was like, I don't know if I'm going to be able to sit through this because it shows, it, it immediately jumps into this action that's, first of all, really dated animation. I don't know what I was hearing. One person say it has good animation. It's very dated, very clum, very, you know, um, generic kind of animation that I think even Pixar 10 years earlier was already leaps and bounds above. It makes Disney look really cheap when it does its early forays into computer animation. Tangled is the first animated CGI film that you're like, this looks expensive because it really looks cheap in those mid 2000s movies. Um, Poorly, uh, like emotive on their animation, their face is so generic. Um, it just takes me out of the film. I think the movie definitely, and, and then in the beginning, it was just this whole like super dog, you know, having to escape. And, you know, it was just too uh, car chase movie kind of action for me. And I was like, again, this doesn't feel like Disney. Uh, and then the movie starts to pick up once it starts to become a traditional kind of like best friend, well, uh, enemies to friends, uh, kind of um, unlikely duo having to, you know, travel across uh, familiar territory. Uh, it starts to become a little bit of a buddy adventure movie. Um, and towards the end, they started to feel some emotion. And overall, it does service. It's serviceable as a film. I think that it has some merit compared to something like Chicken Little, which just feels like something to, you know, entertain little kids. But at the end of the day, Bolt does not really feel like a film that deserves to be on the caliber of what I think Disney can offer us. I mean, I'm not necessarily here to dash the superhero kind of genre. Um, I think Disney can do that better. Uh, but I think what they give us in Bolt, it improves slightly as the film progresses, but it's, you know, not as, as interesting as what The Incredibles are doing. Um, that's for sure. <laughs> All right. At 55, I'm afraid I have to put Dumbo. I think that this is definitely, and I was really shocked when I went on Rotten Tomatoes because Dumbo was listed in the top 10. And that was very bizarre to me. Um, I'd never seen it ranked that high critically. Uh, I think Dumbo is so much a product of its time that I think that's what it drags it down. There's not a lot that is of merit for it to stand the test of time. There are definitely some culturally mildly or not so mildly insensitive depictions of black people in the, the crows. We know what I'm talking about. You've seen the movie, you know what I'm talking about. Um, I'm glad it's not censored off of Disney plus, but definitely needs that warning at the beginning. There are some really, you know, emotively heart tugging kind of moments uh, for this film. And, you know, at this point, we're really getting to pretty much every film above here that I am like, I'd watch this again. Um, also, Dumbo, I did watch as a child. So I do have some affinity for it. Um, the Pink Elephants on Parade number is completely bonkers, but the most creative part of this film uh, as well as, of course, Baby Mine, a sweet, tender moment. Um, there's this definitely this film does a good job at touching on emotion that must most of the great Disney films do um, that most of the films I've touched on so far have not done. And so for that, Dumbo gets its props. But at the end of the day, it's a not wonderfully animated kind of short, forgettable story that doesn't feel grand or serious enough to, at the end of the day, justify a rewatch. Um, it's definitely worth seeing if you've never seen. Um, it's got some really, you know, touching moments, some serviceable, memorable songs. But at the end of the day, it is not, it's not a film that stands the test of time as a classic for me. I don't really think Dumbo belongs in the same category of conversation as Bambi or Pinocchio or Snow White or Cinderella. Because uh, remember, this is from the Golden Age. The Golden Age is, you know, from Snow White through Dumbo. Um, well, actually through Bambi. Uh, okay, at 54, we have Dinosaur. This is, a, this is a film that I am going to admit I had to reevaluate as an adult. Because as a child, I would be like, are you kidding me? This film is so good. <laughs> 
I don't know what this film had a stranglehold on me for, but at, at you know, eight, nine years old, I was lapping this film up. But it has, in hindsight, as watching it as an adult, I understand why I see this film consistently ranked in not just the bottom 10, but usually the bottom five uh, of Disney animated. Um, this is interestingly Disney's first um, fully computer generated uh, film. Uh, so before Chicken Little, they did make Dinosaur. You kind of forget it though, because as much as Chicken Little looks like an an CGI film, I feel like there's something extra children's animation about it. That Dinosaur feels a little bit more live action. And that's because they used a lot of live action backdrops. Basically what they did was, and that's why it's like, is this really even an animated film? There's a lot of live action backdrop with animated creatures in front of it. There is also animated backdrops as well, but they try to make these dinosaurs look like they're in real environments. And I think that's what really allured it to me as a kid. It felt very real. I mean, this was cutting edge CGI for 2000. You have to remember, if you watch it now, it looks kind of dated, but it looks pretty good. I mean, honestly, the dinosaurs, if you've seen Jurassic Park, I don't know. I, it's probably controversial, but I think the dinosaurs look better than they do in Jurassic Park. That's, of course, from seven years earlier, though. So, you know, CGI is advanced. But overall, this is a story that, you know, um, I think most people criticize for having uh, very kind of uninteresting characters, uninteresting dialogue, um, clunky exposition and clunky narrative. Um, there are, I don't know, I, I do want to make sure that I'm separating out all the naysayers from the parts of me that were always drawn to this film as a child. It is still an adventure story that has some excitement to it for me. I mean, it's got really emotive kind of, uh, it's got an emotive kind of moment when the asteroid falls and you see, you know, Aladar, is that his name? I can't remember. Uh, seeing, you know, his whole world and all the people he know get destroyed and then he finds these you know, dinosaurs out in the desert and they have to rebuild. And I think there's some epicness to it. The James Newton Howard score is definitely doing a lot of the heavy lifting for, I think, what I find more positive about this film. Uh, I will also perhaps admit, and might edit this out, that uh, perhaps why I liked this film so much is I was going through a little bit of a dinosaur phase. And uh, <laughs> I'm not ashamed to admit it that as a child, I found the protagonist kind of attractive as a dinosaur. I was like, he's a very handsome dinosaur, which, you know, uh, you know, remember I was nine years old. I wasn't really, you know, <laughs> be that, I'll, I'll just leave that there, be that as it may. I think I had a bit of an, an affinity for him, just like I had an affinity for Barney when I was really little. Something about dinosaurs. Um, so yeah, I think, I think that that has a lot to do with why I viewed this film so highly. But if you look at it narratively, it's, it's not that strong. And, um, the CGI is dated. I think this movie would have actually been so much more wonderful if it had just been fully hand-drawn. I mean, most of them I feel this way about. Finally, finally we get to um, the, the film I talked about with Saludos Amigos. We have The Three Caballeros, uh, released in 1944. So just one year after Saludos Amigos, we finally get a more fully-fledged tribute to Latin America. This definitely feels more like the film that you know, Saludos Amigos was just teasing. Um, they don't really reuse any actual animation. They do reuse some characters and settings. We have Jose Carioca coming back, the cigar smoking parrot, uh, who takes him, uh, who takes Donald Duck around um, all of these Latin American places. We go to Mexico, we go to Brazil, uh, we go to Argentina. We do have some memorable music. By far the best is Baya, Baya. Uh, from the Brazilian state of Bahia is, uh, you know, um, it's like a love letter to the nightlife of that region of Brazil. And it is so infectious and so romantic. And if you watch the film, the beautiful uh, paintings uh, really evoke the whimsical romance of the air of Latin America. It's a beautiful tribute. Um, some of this, I think, is just so lovingly done. And then you do also have, you know, parts of it that feel a little voyeuristic on white culture, looking at other cultures. Um, it kind of creates a comment on colonialism a little bit that, of course, Disney wasn't trying to do. Um, and uh, seeing Donald Duck, you know, uh, looking up the skirts of live action women in Argentina and Mexico and Brazil 
uh, as you know, all these live action scenes, there's a lot of live action in this film. There's so much dancing. Oh, everyone's just wanting to get up and dance all the time. It gets a little bit old. I think this film drags a little bit. It could have been a little shorter um, because there's definitely some bonkers animation, some psychedelia with some of the dancing, with some of uh, Aurora Miranda's performance, which I do think, you know, is very memorable and captivating and entrancing. Um, but you can also see the male gaze, you know, there's something very 1940s about how Donald Duck is interacting with these women, not necessarily something we should be doing. Uh, but, you know, you have to, again, unfortunately, look at where it comes from at the time. And uh, that was just not something that would be criticized. Um, you mean, you have Donald Duck falling in love with Dora Luz, who is this Mexican singer. Um, and Donald gets really, you know smitten uh and it's somewhat narratively connected but it does start to just get a little high on its own supply but at the end of the day the reason why i rank it so high out of the package films there's only one package film that's higher is because i do think it has some of the best animation um melody time is decent animation for the time but i do think that the sequences are so uh, uh creative the dance sequences and how the animation works with the live action um, and the music. The soundtrack is one of the only package films that has really good music uh, that I actually wanted to listen to, you know, after listening to the movie, watching the movie. Uh, so at the end of the day, it is one of the ones I'd be a little bit more tempted to rewatch. And I do think it is a better overall package of exploring Latin America, whereas Saludos Amigos just kind of didn't fully explore that, even though at the end of the day, it does start to become Donald Dunk just chasing women around Latin America. That's sort of what it turns into. Um, but yeah, it, it's it's got some merits. It's got some merits. Perhaps I'm putting it a little higher than I should, but that's how I felt after watching it. I was expecting to not be as into it as I was. And I think that, you know, despite it feeling like it dragged at certain points, it's okay. It's okay. I find it hard to say the things I want to say the most. I find a little bit of steady as All right, at 52, we have the first sequel here that I'm going to be talking about. We have Ralph Breaks the Internet from 2018, a sequel to the much more successful and critically acclaimed Wreck It Ralph. Uh, I don't think that Ralph Breaks the Internet is the absolute worst. Obviously, it's not the absolute worst film on this list. I've seen a lot of people dunk on it, and I do think that I've seen it twice now. It's very. Um, cynical in how it views corporatism and the way even Disney views itself. There's something on the one hand kind of charming, well, not charming, but there's something entertaining about seeing Disney create its own uh, cyber media video game world, which they're actually now trying to do with Epic Games. I think that's really interesting. Um, they sort of prototype it in this film uh, where you have, you know, the Marvel house and you have the Star Wars, Star Wars house, and you have the Disney animation house. And then of course you've got all the Disney princesses. They steal the show. They steal the show. And I love seeing them interact, but there is also something that is very anti Walt Disney's legacy about everything this film represents. Um, and the way that the IP of the film, the film is about IP. Um, it's completely, you know, aware of its own corporate branding. And I think that makes it kind of uncanny for a lot of people. Um, you know, even though there is high stakes to the movie, it feels like a giant parody of itself at the end of the day. But there is a lot of fan service. And there is a lot of, you know, if you want to see Pocahontas and all of these, if you want to see all these Disney princesses collaborate and, you know, kick butt at the end of the day to save the day, it's like, it's good fan service for, you know, Disney addicts. But at the end of the day, it doesn't offer a lot of artistic um, merit outside of the corporate branding of its own, you know, creator. So, yeah, a, a far cry from what Disney can achieve. Um, it's it's a bit of a lazy sequel. Vanellope's character is uh, isn't as likable as she is in the first. I mean, she's incredibly selfish. <laughs> she's incredibly selfish throughout the whole film. Um, and uh, then has the gall to once again, you know, blame poor Ralph. Uh, I just haven't seen a lot of people love this film or react to it that strongly. Um, and so uh, at the end of the day, I, I, I don't think that this one is a, exactly a winner. Strange World, 
uh, from 2022. Uh, I've only seen this film once. It is one of the newer ones. I do feel like I need to see it again sometime soon. Um, it doesn't have very strong reviews, and it's coming off of a really poor advertising campaign. No one knew this movie existed, and it absolutely bombed at the box office. One of the worst box office bombs in Disney's history, especially if you take out the pandemic. Um, I think that Strange World has some great ideas that could have just better been better flushed out. Um, I also think that Strange World, the biggest problem with it narratively is that it tries to tackle so many issues um, that could be, you know, very topical for LGBT people, for uh, for parents and children. It tries to throw, and then of course, on top of that, the very heavy-handed environmentalism message, with some subtle talks about racism, it tries to throw all of these messages into the movie, and they all get a little bit lost. Uh, they all feel a little bit like they're just there to check a box for a story that, you know, goes through all these beats. Um, at the end of the day, this is a movie about environmentalism. And it almost kind of sidetracks that to share this, this LGBT plot and a story between a father and a son. But I honestly feel like it needed to pick its own lane. Uh, it needed to pick one lane and go in that one. Um, I think Strange World, I don't necessarily think uh, it's terrible or that bad, but I definitely think it could have benefited from having more memorable characters, a sense of feeling of these characters really having a little bit more of a purpose for being who they are in the story. Uh, and I think that the um, at the end of the day, I'm going to be honest with you, the musicals are always going to be more memorable. I think the lack of music, there's not even like music played over scenes, like some of them, like in Treasure Planet. Um, there's not even, uh, is it called diegetic music versus, I can't remember the term. Um, it's just, it's a straight up, you know, adventure kind of sci-fi film. And I think that those are really hit or miss for the company. I think Disney maybe might want to stay away from doing them. If they're going to do them, they need to be super serious in tone. They need to have some serious edginess. Uh, instead of just being about like fun, gooey creatures and, and doing a little bit of a knockoff of other animated films that are kind of similar. Uh, because this feels very kind of derivative of other animated films and its environments and, you know, sidekicks and wacky little characters. Brother Bear, I saw as a kid and then saw again as an adult to make this video. Um, I think that this movie, uh, talk about needing to be more serious. There's a whole part of this movie where it just becomes the two elk kind of making jokes and very, it's very children's humor. And I think that really drags much of the film down. I think laid back, you know, kind of fun humor, children's humor can have its place in a movie that's better sprinkled throughout but then it carries the you know weight of the film throughout evenly as well. And I think the movie has a hard time keeping its subject matter, you know, distinct throughout. It's kind of serious at the beginning, you know? I mean, the first portion of it, it's like, it's this kind of serious subject matter. And then it becomes kind of jaunty and kind of silly and irreverent before trying to, oh yeah, we got to wrap up this very serious plot. Um, and so I do think, you know, it's important for Indigenous stories to be told. This is obviously um, representing, you know, uh, Alaskan Indigenous culture. Uh, but a lot of Indigenous people are like, why do they have to turn them into animals? <laughs> That's a problem Princess and the Frog has. POC keep getting turned into animals in Disney movies. Um, but Brother Bear, you know, I mean, I don't think it does a terrible job with representation or inaccurate representation. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, these kinds of stories are really important to be told. And I do think that this has some of the most breathtaking backdrops of animation. Um, everything is like a Whistler painting. Uh, the gorgeous oil paintings of, you know, the mountains and the forests and the waterfalls, the lighting, it is just absolutely gobsmacking. Um, not to mention the Phil Collins soundtrack. It is nowhere near as strong as Tarzan. You know, it still tugs at the heartstrings in certain in certain moments. No Way Out is the highlight song from that soundtrack. There's a there's definitely a, a beauty to this film, um, but there are definitely parts of it that could do without the stupid elk humor.
<laughs> uh, I could do without kind of the, the cheesiness of some of the, the animal sidekick characters. Frozen 2. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, I believe this is the highest grossing Disney animated feature film. Yes, this one crossed the billion dollar threshold. Uh, the only other uh, Disney films, animated films to do that are Zootopia and the first Frozen. So, uh, you know, that's pretty significant. Frozen is obviously a billion dollar franchise for Disney. Uh, and it was their last actual real hit. Uh, but of course, the pandemic happened right after. Plus Disney Plus. That's a combination that's caused a lot of problems for the Disney box office. So that's another video. Frozen 2 is nowhere near the quality uh, of story. And I think the music is also still not quite up. I still, I don't think that Into the Unknown is um, unworthy of a follow-up to Let It Go. I think Into the Unknown... I used to actually prefer it to Let It Go, but I think Let It Go was just so overplayed that at the time I felt like Into the Unknown was something new. And I also love that Aurora, who is a Norwegian artist that I love on this channel on his spotlight, features in the backing vocal of that track, the response section. When she's in the film, you can hear Aurora singing in a Disney movie. So that's definitely the coolest thing about it. Uh, so I do love that song, and I also love All Is Found, you know, sung uh, by the mother character at the beginning. It's this beautiful, gorgeous lullaby, folk lullaby. I love Casey Musgrave's version for the soundtrack. It's so rich, such beautiful folk country guitar. Uh, the rest of the music, though, not as impressive. Um, and I think that Frozen 2 feels very much like a corporate product of how do we deliver a sequel to a billion dollar franchise, uh, a billion dollar animated film? Um, I think that the overall story just doesn't feel as uh, considered in what the characters are actually meant to do. They're going on a quest uh, that, you know, has, I think, some superhero origin story kind of stuff going on, you know, for Elsa. Once again, you know, she's um, getting called away. Uh, and kind of reclusive from her superpowers with ice. And there are some interesting sort of mythological kind of themes coming through. I do like some of the world building in this. I mean, I like a mythological Nordic story. Uh, but at the end of the day, I think that this film is uh, pretty lackluster considering, you know, as much as I think Frozen is a tad overrated, it's a pretty good, worthy follow-up to the big mega Disney musicals of the 90s. Uh, and I think that Frozen 2 just doesn't quite have the same emotional impact in the story. It doesn't quite have the same narrative thrust that the first made the first so strong. The first was, of course, adapted from a literal fairy tale. So you could tell they were literally having to completely go off the rails trying to make up a story here. The highlight scene from the film. Anna, Elsa, Sven, Samantha. Samantha. Yeah, that, so that scene alone, I don't love Olaf, but every time I see it, I've only seen this movie two times. I just, sometimes stupid humor really gets me. Big Hero 6. I had never seen this movie until about a year ago, maybe two years ago now. I can't quite recall. Um, it just completely went under my radar. I didn't really check for this when it came out. Didn't even realize it was a Disney movie because so much of this film is much more, I think, Pixar, uh, in, in, in the Pixar spirit, I should say. Um, and I still, I don't like saying that I feel like Disney animation should stick to like princess movies and kind of like fairy tales, but I do... Mm, I, I feel like, because I, I do love Atlantis and Treasure Planet. Um, I, I feel like Disney, it's so tricky in the Black Cauldron. I feel like it's so tricky with Disney when they try and tackle like superhero stuff and very kind of like futuristic. Zootopia is a good example. I, I, I think Big Hero 6 overall just, it still at the end of the day is a superhero story that I don't have any nostalgia for. I only saw for the first time as an adult going through the Disney catalog. 
and I was entertained, but it did not leave a lasting impact. I really have no desire to see this movie again. Um, Baymax is adorable. He's this like inflatable personal helper robot. Um, he really is the, you know, I feel like the entire movie should have been called Baymax. Um, there's an actually a Disney spinoff show called Baymax. But overall, Big Hero 6 left me feeling like I had just watched uh, a lesser animated studio put out uh, fun, you know, adequate sci-fi, sci-fi thriller. Um, but I didn't feel that again, music, the music was missing for me. Eh, it's just hard. It's just hard. It's beautifully animated. The San Francisco, uh, futuristic blend of Tokyo and San Francisco, I thought was very interesting as a setting. <laughs> I can explain. Okay, this is where I'm going to get pillaged. Uh, at 47, I am placing the Robin Hood film from 1973. Uh, hear me out. Hear me out. You can have a good time with this film. And as some others point out with my favorite films, you can acknowledge that they're maybe not up to the quality of others. And I feel like the problem for me with Robin Hood is that I only watched this movie, I believe, maybe twice, but definitely only once as a child. And the one time I did see it, it didn't have a lasting impact on me. Um, it was not what we were getting continually from the rental store, and I did not own a copy at home on VHS. So Robin Hood, when I rewatched it again in college because I was curious, I just was like, what is all the hype about? Um, I think that this has some of the roughest animation. Um, the, this is from a period called the Bronze Age, but which is also called the Dark Age of Disney. And the 70s, Disney was really struggling financially. There's a reason why they only put out several films in the 70s and 80s. Walt Disney's death the decade before um, had really shaken up the company, and it was hard to know, you know, who was going to really steer the ship in the right direction. The company almost didn't survive. So some of the films they put out, I think some of them were underrated cult classics and others like the Robin Hood, which is sort of in that status. Uh, I don't know. It's such a beloved film. Everyone just absolutely loves the characters. They think it's just a really entertaining story to see on screen. I don't see it. I see anthropomorphic animals recreating the Robin Hood story with very shoddy animation, uh, charming, but kind of bland characters and not like I don't know, nothing really whimsical or that escapist about it. I mean, there's no real music about this that really draws me in. There's nothing about the, the title sequence or the lingering atmosphere of the film. It's just a silly animated cartoon. And I think maybe for people who are looking for that, you know, who are looking for a Tom and Jerry kind of thing, I don't know, maybe this is more their cup of tea. But... I don't see quite as much high art merit in this film. It's where it is for the reason I'm putting out right there. I'm, I'm really sorry. I will kind of qualify that my next spot has a similar issue. The Great Mouse Detective is another, I think, somewhat beloved uh, under, you know, well, actually, The Great Mouse Detective the Black Cauldron was such a box office failure that any kind of movie that actually made any form of profit was kind of a success for Disney. So even though it wasn't a runaway success uh, at the box office and with physical sales, The Great Mouse Detective was the beginning of the Michael Eisner era. It was the beginning of maybe Disney is going to rejuvenate itself. And that is sort of the pre-Renaissance period that we come into in the late 80s before The Little Mermaid. Uh, I also, similarly to Robin Hood, only saw this movie, I believe, once as a kid, and it was perfectly fine. I remember I was home from school and I was sick, and it was just one of those cartoons you put on. And then I feel like watching it again, I had a really hard time uh, finding interest in the story, and it really struggled to keep my attention. Um, these, these animal caper films from Disney, if you don't have pre-attached nostalgia, really hard to get into. Um, interestingly, this is actually the first Disney animated film to actually feature any sort of computer-generated uh, CGI imagery. Um, the scene with uh, Radigan, the villain, and he is a great—he is a great villain uh, in the clock, 
in the clock with the cogs is actually some CGI, which is kind of a big deal. It's prototype CGI. It's not like full on CGI, um, but it's prototype. And that's kind of like a big deal. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a Sherlock Holmes uh, spinoff with a rat living in the house of Sherlock Holmes. Uh, it's adjacent Sherlock Holmes. Uh, it's cute. It's certainly worth a watch, but it is, at the end of the day, number 46 for me. Now at number 45, we have the last of the anthology war films. This one's from 1949, The Adventures of Ichabod and Mr. Toad. A lot of nostalgia is front-loaded into why this is placed as high as it is. I could see a lot of people not quite putting it so high on their list. I think most people acknowledge that it is the best out of the anthology war films. But, you know, putting it above Robin Hood, you know, some people might be like, what are you doing? Uh, but hear me out. I think that these two shorts, which are stitched together, again, it's similar to Fun and Fancy Free, except there are no overlaying narrators and weird puppets doing stupid, cringy jokes. It is just, a, a, you know, a classic, you know, uh, bedtime story narrator voice telling you the beginning of these stories as you open up the storybooks. This one is so nostalgic for me because I did own this. I had this on VHS as a kid. My mom had gotten it for its 50th anniversary release on VHS in 1999. It was the first time it was ever available in that format. And, um, you know, I, I knew that it was sort of a, like, really deep cut Disney film. It wasn't like the ones I always wanted to own, uh, like Beauty and the Beast, which were locked in the vault. Uh, but it was what was available, and it was probably a lot cheaper than some of those VHSs. Because, you know, VHSs were expensive back in the day, especially the way Disney had them locked in the vault created a lot of scarcity and a lot of hype and they can inflate the prices. Uh, so I was happy and content with what I could get. And I watched the crap out of this film. I watched it so much as a kid. The Wind in the Willows is the first section based on the uh, illustrated novel by Kenneth Graham. Uh, and then the second is the story of Ichabod Crane uh, from The Legend of Sleepy Hollow. Uh, so interestingly, the, uh, Mickey and the Beanstalk short was actually originally going to be stitched together with, uh, the Wind in the Willow short, but, uh, the powers uh, the other people at Disney decided against, uh, they, I don't know, Walt didn't end up going with that plan. Um, and so Wind and the Willows ended up getting put with their Ichabod and Mr. Uh, their Ichabod story. I do think the Ichabod story is stronger but The Wind in the Willows, it's cute. I mean, rewatching it as an adult, you know, um, I will say there is something about The Wind in the Willows for me that will always kind of have a little bit of a tie into why I fell in love with visual storytelling. But in, in the animated form, the painting and illustration of The Wind in the Willows is absolutely gorgeous. The paintings are so pastoral and I had a book that had illustrations of the Kenneth Grant story, and I was between those two. I was just really inspired to draw myself as a kid. So, as a burgeoning artist, uh, both of these shorts were extremely. I mean, the Ichabod is, is less of a realistic style, and they go for more of a um, stylized look, where depth and perspective are not as important, and it's more about you know caricatures of humans like it's it's very caricaturized and it has its own charm um but i definitely went in the willows visually was just obviously swept away uh but it isn't as compelling of a story um the ichabod the legend of sleepy harrow story about the headless horseman was so scary to me as a kid uh and that was also kind of what kept me coming back for more i loved things that scared me um, and, uh, this didn't scare me too much, but it was just the right level of spooky that I could get like super invested and would get that adrenaline going. Um, so I absolutely adore the music in the Ichabod section, which is more of a musical. We actually have, uh, some actual singing from, uh, Oliver Wallace. We also have Bing Crosby coming in here. Um, and, uh, you know, the song Katrina is, is, is definitely a highlight, uh, so it's dated, but it's still so rich in the kind of legacy of, of illustration and animation that Disney was really at its peak for. And I think that, um, for its time, it's just absolutely gorgeous, especially if you see it like remastered in high definition. It's one of those Disney films not a lot of people have seen, and I highly recommend it if you haven't. This is not a, this is not one of those grown watches that, you know, some of the other anthologies are. 
Um, this one feels like a worthy inclusion into the Disney animated canon. Meet the Robinsons. This was a this is a weird one. Um, there's so much heart and so much creativity imbued in this story that uh, is ultimately weighed down by the, the the janky animation, the 2007 Disney Studios animation, which again, like at least a decade behind Pixar animation. Um, you know, it's it's crazy to just see the contrast between you know Meet the Robinsons and Wall-E. Though again, slightly some of the style they were going for. Um, I've not seen this movie as much as I probably should to definitively review it as like the in-depth critique I should give it. Um, it's all over the place. A boy who wants to be a young invent, who wants to be an inventor. And, uh, he creates a time machine that takes him to the year 2037, where he meets this eccentric Robinson family. Um, and, and since he's an orphan, he's looking for his mother. So he would happily get adopted if he could. They try to adopt him. Wilbur, who is the 13 year old boy he meets in the present day before going to the future with him to see his futuristic family. I'm not going to spoil it, but there's a time travel -y kind of reveal. Um, so, you know, that that is the most compelling thing about the narrative. What I love the most about the film is how at the very end, there is a tribute to Walt Disney. Around here, we don't look backwards for very long. We keep moving forward, opening up new doors and doing new things because we're curio curious and curiosity keeps leading us down new paths. Uh, for all that I don't think Meet the Robinsons is that memorable, I do think it very much is in the spirit of Disney animation from the early days where we're not doing sequels. We're moving forward and doing things that are perhaps a little off the wall, a little off kilter, maybe not commercially performative, but we still do it anyway in the name of art and exploration. Uh, so props to Van Anderson, the director, for, for wanting to make something that probably wasn't on paper sounding like a very good idea <laughs> uh, as like a, as, as a good pitch. Um, it's very hard to pitch this kind of story and say, this is a great idea. It's middle of the road. That's the territory we're starting to get to here. Uh, and it is based on a book. Most of the Disney animated films are based on literary sources. This is a, a William Joyce novel. Big old battle, tough old town, it's true. Oliver and Company, another one that I owned as a kid on VHS and watched, you know, so many times, um, became memorized. Uh, this is one that I probably have more nostalgia, kind of giving a favorable impression for. I know a lot of people are not, they don't hate it, but they just like this film is just kind of there or it has some glaring issues with the plot. I think the opening sequence uh, with young Oliver in the uh, shoebox trying to get adopted is just the most heart-wrenching, sad thing. And as a kid, it was just, oh, get the tissues. Uh, we've got that gorgeous um, Huey Lewis, the pop song kind of playing us in. And then we've got Billy Joel and Why Should I Worry? Uh, everyone, you know, points to this as the standout. This is this is doing a lot of the heavy lifting for why this film is at number 43. Uh, Billy Joel really sings the hell out of this song and it's animated so well, seeing Dodger on these construction cranes and all the animals getting down to the New York City beat. Um, I was jamming as a, you know, six-year-old. Um, but we also have Bette, Bette Midler's number, Perfect Isn't Easy. That is also, let's not forget, that is also a very cheeky, very fun, um, kind of uh, somewhat villainous number uh, midway through the film. And Bette Midler's character, I think, is, is quite a showstopper. Uh, and yeah, I, I, it's, it's got some real heart to it. I'm sorry, I'm a little bit, the schmaltz is on the schmaltz. The schmaltz is doing the schmaltzing. It does have, you know, a lot of stereotypes represented in sort of inner city characters that may or may not be, mm, eh, they may or not be the best choices. Uh, and overall, I think the plot itself, uh, the villain, you know, this is inspired by Oliver Twist, but with animals. Disney loves to do that kind of story. Uh, you know, for all that this film doesn't have the greatest critical acclaim, it was the first animated film to ever globally cross the 100 million mark at the box office. 
And the success of it actually led Peter Schneider, the executive animation at the time, to say, you know what, I think we have the steam going. We can release films annually at this point. This is really the kickoff. I mean, everyone talks about The Little Mermaid starting the Renaissance, but for Oliver and company to have been such a success, that was kind of what ushered in the Renaissance to begin with. It gave them the comfort to really, you know, take off. So it deserves props there. All right, at number 42, we have the most recent entrant onto this list. We have 2023's Wish, a film that was sort of used as a commemoration to celebrate 100 years of the animation studio uh, of the Disney company. The animation studio is technically 100 years old because it started with Walt Disney's original company. But keep in mind, Snow White and the Seven Dwarves didn't come out until 1937. So, you know, at least over 80 years we're celebrating here still. Uh, and um, at the end of Wish, you see every animated film, uh, almost every other animated film referenced, which I think is so moving and very much catering to the Disney ch the, the, the Disney adults, <laughs> which I think was a big critique a lot of people had of this film. Look, I've seen people rank Wish way lower, and I have seen currently it having the lowest rating on uh, Letterboxd. Uh, I think it's a little ridiculous that this film is the absolute worst rated of all 62 films on Letterboxd. I think it really goes to show how people on Letterboxd are really only rating more recent films, and they're not really going back and doing a lot of logging and rating for older films. Um, so newer films are going to get more ratings, which means they're going to have a more well-rounded aggregate score. And older films are mostly going to be more positive people going back and saying, I loved this film. And you know what I mean? So I feel like that's why Wish is currently at the bottom. It doesn't deserve it. It's the same problem with Rotten Tomatoes. Um, this is not the worst Disney animated film. Look, I have about 20 films below it. Okay. The 20 films that I listed below it, I still feel confident. And it took me a while to think, where does this film sit? because it's the newest entry. I saw it in theaters. And let me tell you, I went in knowing that my expectations need to be kind of low, which was upsetting because I was really hoping that this was going to be a smash, that this was going to be really effective and really beautiful. But I knew going in, my expectations had to be tempered. And doing that helped. I kind of went in knowing that there was going to be some real corniness, that the animation was not going to look as great, and uh, what to look out for. I had a wonderful time with it. Okay, now that I knew all those things, I was not bored. I was fully engrossed in the story. I was engrossed by the visuals. I mean, maybe, okay, maybe there were a couple moments where it wasn't the most riveting. But at the end of the day, I knew it wasn't a super long movie. It just, it was the right pace. It felt like pretty quick, light on its feet. Yeah, not that deep of a story. There are a lot of things I would love to take the story and twist and improve. Um, I think that that's a wonderful idea that's not executed that strongly. I think it's it's perhaps a little confusing, and it's just potentially not as explored as richly as it could be. Ariana DeBose's character of Asha doesn't actually have her own wish. Uh, her wish is that her father can get his wish, or is it her grandfather? Can't quite remember. Uh, and I get the altruism, but I feel like it makes her kind of motive in the story feel a little bit backseat. Um, and she ends up wanting to free everyone's wishes. Uh, now, Chris Pine is definitely the standout. King Magnifico, he is, he is a very handsome, dastardly villain, and he is sort of a return to form for an actual villain, because for a long time now, Disney Animation has shied away from doing traditional villains. The villain has been off-camera, some sort of, you know, familial trauma or a liar-reveal trope. It's interesting to see them return to a little bit more of the classic, you know, witch-in-the-tower trope, his villain song is kind of corny, but it kind of works when you see the film and still is catchy. Uh, I will say the music is the strongest part of this film. I think that the I Want song, This Wish, although a little clumsy, I talk about it in my ranking of every uh, my favorite songs of 2023, which I actually would sort of amend now and perhaps swap out this song, uh, This Wish, with At All Costs which is a duet from the beginning of the film with King Magnifico and Asha. I think At All Costs is a stronger song. I think that is the, the power ballad of the film with the most emotion and kind of beautiful melody. 
I love the animated sequence of all of the orbs dancing to the music. I just, I felt the Disney magic while watching it. I'm sorry, okay? I got swept up in it. I know everyone was saying you weren't supposed to. This is a soulless corporate product that doesn't have any magic in it. And I still see, I still see magic in Disney animation. And I saw in Wish. I saw, I saw that, you know, optimistic kind of um, buoyant creative spark. Uh, but speaking of the, the actual star, which this is a movie kind of paying homage to the wishing star from the original Pinocchio. And you see the wishing star in Princess and the Frog and, you know, Peter Pan. And like it's, it's in all these Disney movies is like a wish, you know, a trope. This star is anthropomorphized as more of like a Lumi. If you're familiar with the Mario Party universe, it looks so much like a Lumi. Basically, this like something that'll sell like hell on plushies. Uh, it's really cute, but wouldn't it have been amazing if it had actually been a Peter Pan-esque love interest for Asha? If you've seen the early concept art for the movie, you know what I'm talking about. They originally were going to have him be a love interest. And I think that would have made the story way more interesting. Um, I think the movie is really missing some positive male presence. Uh, because, you know, this is a critique that you could have of Disney today. Uh heterosexual male men are not portrayed very uh very nice in disney i think you know we have christoph but we can't like like completely rely on christoph um so i do feel like uh you know um obviously disney's always been a little bit more of a girly brand but i just think having that love interest uh would have helped balance out and it would have given asha more to explore with her own character because i do feel like she is so underexplored her character is so on the surface and kind of bland for that reason. She does have that, as, com as many have commented, that adorable personality that is like a copy paste of owing all the way back to like sort of uh, Rapunzel. Uh, it's been like the same character copied and pasted over and over all of these uh, Disney animated princesses. So I want to see these, print, you know, characters have a little bit more standing out uh, to differentiate themselves from other Disney heroines. Um yeah, at the end of the day, it's got all those Easter eggs. Uh, they're fun. I don't think they're too heavy-handed, but at the same time, yeah, you do, as one commenter said, it makes you think of better Disney films and makes you wish you were watching that. But don't be too dissuaded. This this film is light on its feet. It moves through quickly. It's got still some gorgeous animation and some heart. Um it's got some Disney magic, okay? It's it's like watching the fireworks over Cinderella's castle. It's it's a little saccharine. It's not like super deep, but it's still got some magic. And there is something to the score that I think understates that. Um, the worst song is probably I'm a Star. I think that the lyrics are a lot of nothing. Uh, and they're trying to chase Lin-Manuel Miranda's rhyme schemes. And I'm not the hugest Lin-Manuel Lin Miranda Lin-Manuel Miranda fan, but his absence and then the fact that they're trying to chase his success, Julia Michaels, the songwriter, they really need someone in musical theater writing these songs. I think, you know, I talk about this with this wish. There's just uh, a clumsiness to how they try to adapt pop hooks and melodies and structures into a Broadway setting, musical theater setting, and it just doesn't work. And also the obsession with rapping in the chorus, in the verses. We don't need to rap in the verses all the time. This isn't, you know, this is its own thing. We didn't necessarily need that, but it is at the end of the day what it is. So overall, Wish is not the worst thing in the world, but I do think it's a real shame that not only was it such a box office failure, but that it was lauded as such a big comeback for the studio. I think other films that have come out recently would have been better served for that purpose, um, and I think that that's why it's so embarrassing for the studio. And that's why they're shifting to sequels that made a lot of money the first time. Uh, you will not be seeing a Wish sequel. I mean, let's be real. There are so many other Disney movies that will get sequels before Wish. And I don't think the studio is... Um, yeah, and, and it's a shame because they're learning the wrong lessons. It's about being bold and adventurous and doing things that, you know, I don't want to say could be polarizing, but maybe aren't super, like trying to appeal to everyone at the same time. Having something a little niche is a good thing. And this movie is anything but. This movie is the most vanilla, let's cater to everyone and make a somewhat AI-generated story. Uh, and the interesting kind of animation twist of having it be slightly like hand-drawn, which I do love, actually flattens a lot of the light and the kind of uh, 
rendering and shadowing so that a lot of the characters don't look very well lit, um, which gives it a very sort of C like level animation, direct to video kind of, you know, Tinkerbell movie kind of aesthetic. So that's unfortunate. It doesn't look as expensive as it is. Okay, at 41, we have the Aristocats. This is a fun romp that finally spotlights cats. I know Oliver and Company technically had a, a, a feline protagonist, but there were mostly dogs in that film. As a cat lover, I really like, you know, give it to the cats. There's so many movies about dogs in Disney. The cats needed their own film. This movie is probably uh, the roughest in terms of animation. I think you can really tell that they were struggling um, I believe it's also the first film uh, to not have any real input from Walt Disney. He didn't really have anything to do with this film. Or maybe he did. It might have been just in the early stages of development. So it might actually have been the last one he greenlit. I'm not sure. Um, but The Aristocats is light on its feet and, again, a fun time. Very sketchy. I actually kind of, I kind of like the sketchiness. It, it reminds me of, you know, um, some Monet kind of uh, Paris. The Impressionists, the sort of lightness of it, it it's, and the, um, the, the, the lack of hard lines, it's, it's kind of evocative of the Impressionists. And I think that fits the Parisian style. Oh, um, and I actually think it works well for the Aristocats being set in Paris. But um, if you didn't grow up with it, this movie is is very forgettable. That's all I'm going to say. Uh, if you didn't grow up with it, you're going to be like, okay, cute, but not a very, very, very compelling story. Lady and the Tramp. The animal movies are all modeled off of Lady and the Tramp. Lady and the Tramp is the original Disney animal film. And, uh, well, Bambi is, but Bambi is sort of a little bit more, uh, eh, Bambi's different. Bambi's different. I think Lady and the Tramp is a little bit more of the style what you see a lot of the animal caper movies being going forward from Disney. There's a lot here to love. There's so many iconic scenes and music, um, beautifully animated. The settings are all, I love how you don't really see the humans, but you see their feet. Um, the story is very low stakes, even though it's kind of high stakes when you get into the mindset of the animals, but when you step back from that, it's a very low stakes film. Uh, but it's sweet and innocent and, uh, very romantic. Uh, it's the most romantic, obviously, animal film. Um, for that, it gets, I mean, for being still from the golden age, um, of this, well, it's actually from the silver age. The silver age is the 1950s films. Um, which don't make no mistake, we're still Disney riding very high and proud. Bella Note is is one of the most beautiful melodies uh, composed for Disney. Uh, yeah, I don't have that much else to say. I think it's perfectly harmless and fun and beautiful and bittersweet. Uh, and it's at number forty. Raya and the Last Dragon uh, is a film that I want to love more. But at the end of the day, I feel like the story is so kind of um, rushed and not well considered that the the the, the, mo the bones are there for something really interesting. Uh, I feel like they really could have had like a Kung Fu Panda trilogy on their hands with Raya. I know, Not that every movie needs to be a sequel, but I could see the potential. This is set in Southeast Asia in a mythical land called Kumandra. And I really love how each region is modeled after a dragon. So you've got spine, you've got tail, you've got fang. Um, and all of these regions are sort of different elemental areas. So there's a little bit of Avatar, The Last Airbender inspiration there. So you've got like the desert, you've got the water, and you've got the, the forest and earth. Um, and Raya, you know, is, is trying to rescue this dragon um, who is, you know, destined to help save them from this dark evil dragon force that's turning everyone to stone um and her including her own father uh you know watching it a second time i enjoyed it way more i think that this film has a lot going for it visually uh it has a lot going for it with the music james newton howard coming back for the score bravo bravo he hasn't worked on a disney film since treasure planet so it was nice to see them bringing him back on board uh Sisu is voiced by Aquafina, and you know, you either love her or you hate her. Aquafina, I don't, 
I don't personally have a problem with her in this movie. It's not like Scuttle and the Little Mermaid. But yeah, it drags the film down a little bit with how corny it is, how, you know, one note her character can be. Um, but yeah, there's something to this story that I was just like, wow, this is like a really exciting mythological quest. It's kind of like Lord of the Rings-esque, um, you know, because of how it, it also reminded me of Aragon, if you've with the Christopher Paolini novels. So much here that I love to see Disney animation exploring. I just would have loved it to have been a musical. Uh or I would have liked for it to have maybe added maybe like a little bit more time in each of the regions uh, so that all of the characters that she ends up accruing around her don't just sort of feel slapdash and sort of unexplored. But it's hard. You know, this movie's going through such a large chunk of story in a relatively short space. Um, it has a very heavy handed message about blindly trusting people, which I've heard some people think is a little too... Uh, reckless in its messaging because you know if you follow the story you just end up getting hurt you need to like look out for yourself too but it's so cynical to view the world that way and there's this is a disney film right disney is not meant to be cynical disney is meant to be inspiring hope and sort of ideals in people that we're supposed to strive for uh, it's not really meant to be like super like mundane and so and and depressing so i think that the ending of the way they all kind of um, use trust to save the kingdom is really beautiful. But I can understand why some people think it's it's a little on the nose and perhaps a little reckless. Okay, doesn't always work out that way. <laughs> You're lucky that everyone ended up being altruistic here uh, because the villain is, the villain is again, you know, uh, a surprise and then the villain turns and becomes good. And there's this push and pull. And I know some people just want classic villains to just be villains. It's not this complicated. But that's more real life. That's more real life. So I, I can't really critique it for that. Uh, so gorgeous animation. One of the more beautiful CGI films we've gotten in the last decade. But uh, still not quite on the cusp of being great. The Rescuers Down Under might be shockingly high to a lot of people. I have an affinity for it because uh, we watched it a lot on VHS. I believe I actually did own this one. I'm not entirely sure, but I did watch it a ton. Um, I didn't own the original Rescuers. So when I got a chance to see that, it was like a huge deal because I loved the original Rescuers. But The Rescuers Down Under is pretty good. It's not as good. Uh, it's from 1990. This was their first ever sequel. Uh, Disney really tried it out, and I'm glad they did because, you know, some people are like, I don't want to see these mice. A lot of reviewers are like, these mice are uninteresting. They don't hold your attention. You don't care about them. I don't know what movie they're watching. I, I really don't know how much more personality you could put into two mice. Bianca and Bernard are oozing with personality. They're oozing with charm and cuteness and you just care so much about them and I think maybe the problem this film has is that they're not in it as much this film is so much more set in Australia where this boy named Cody is trying to rescue this eagle and this guy this poacher is trying to collect the eggs and you know uh they end up having Cody gets in trouble because he tries to protect the eggs and then they have to call international rescue or whatever it's called the rescue aid society and uh they have those sequences with the Orville the albatross coming in. I mean, it's, I don't know, what could you more, what more could you want from like, a, you know, could have probably gone direct to DVD, like the opening in this movie in theaters. It does have some gorgeous, Bruce Broughton, who does the score, was cooking. Okay, those, those cinematic motifs when, you know, those sweeping orchestral and uh, trumpet motifs uh, riding the eagle are tear, tear, tear jerking. Um, there's some gorgeous, you know, musician, uh, some motifs music musically here. Uh, and yeah, I don't know, like, the villain is kind of compelling because of how real he is. Uh, so kind of Indian story. Um, and uh, I think that it's always relevant and timely. And I like seeing Australia give its, get its spotlight. Disney hasn't really done anything with Australia yet. Um, so I don't know. I don't know why people are so down against this film. Um, but I think, again, if you didn't grow up with it, 
But there's more here than the Aristocats. So I can, I, I, I don't, anyway, that, that's all I can say. Okay, gang, see you next week. Listen, I can't do snack. Wreck-It Ralph. Again, maybe I'm rating this a little low. I only watched Wreck-It Ralph more recently. I didn't follow it when it came out. Um, again, you wouldn't be wrong considering thinking this came from Pixar. This is definitely more of a Pixar film. But I, you know, Disney can experiment. This is a bunch of video game characters inside of an arcade. I think it's a brilliant concept who have this sort of realization that they're in an arcade. And then they um, wreck it. Ralph's game is getting turned off and they're trying to prevent that from happening because no one's playing his game. Um, or is it the other way around? Vanellope's game is getting turned off because no one's playing it. She's in this like sugar rush game, which is sort of like Mario Kart. Uh, and there's some really fun uh, uh, Mario Kart-esque sequences in this film. Um, I've already ranked the first movie way lower than this, so you can obviously tell this is way better. This is way more critically acclaimed. Everyone is pretty much on board that this is one of the better 2010s Disney films, but I just don't quite get how high it is on some people's lists. But again, maybe if you grew up with it as a kid, it would a little bit more enlarge in your heart and you would defend this movie more staunchly. But for me, it's almost exactly middle of the road, which is pretty much right where we're getting to. The Many Adventures of Winnie the Pooh, an anthology series from 1977. Uh, Winnie the Pooh is such a beloved uh, staple of children's literature that I don't mind Winnie, I don't mind Disney constantly dredging up. They do so much with Winnie the Pooh, but this was the one, this was what started it all. There are three shorts, Winnie the Pooh and the Honey Tree, Winnie the Pooh and the Blustery Day, and Winnie the Pooh and Tigger 2. Personally, I find Winnie the Pooh and the Honey Tree to be my favorite just because of how charming and sweet it is. I mean, Pooh <laughs> getting his getting his butt stuck in those holes. <laughs> it's so it's so sweet and funny and you can't help but have a smile on your face the whole time. Like there's something so soothing about the animation, um, the storybook element of how it comes to life off the page. I love how the page is turned with the story and who interacts with the type. Uh, and you just can't ask for something more heartwarming and uh, safe for children as the Hundred Acre Wood and the Winnie the Pooh universe. Um, you know, if you take away the beloved IP as a story, it's kind of simple and um, definitely geared for young children. But I, I think that it's something I can't wait to show all kids uh, and my kids, like all these movies, I can't wait to show my potential children one day. And uh, if you don't, if you don't, if you're not moved by these stories, you just don't have a heart. <laughs> you don't have a heart. But then above it, we have 2011's reiteration of Winnie the Pooh. It's, it's not fully a sequel. It's just another anthology in the long story of anthologies for Winnie the Pooh. This is to date the last actually animated, fully animated film from Walt Disney Animation Studios. I hope it comes back. I hope that it's not the end. Um, I do think it's somewhat fitting to end on Winnie the Pooh because it's such a back to roots kind of story. Um, obviously the animation is so much crisper. The lines are crisper. The colors are more vibrant. Um, the textures and, and the depth more detailed. And so that makes this so mesmerizing of a world to inhabit. And overall, it, it's slightly better because it's one full story. Uh, it's light and, uh, you know, it's, it's low stakes like a Winnie the Pooh story would be, but perhaps also a little bit more enjoyable as an adult to watch just because they're a little bit more considering the parents watching as well um, with the humor. And so once again, Pooh is out of honey and he's going on these crazy adventures to find it with his beloved human sidekick, Christopher Robin. Shout out to Pooh's grand adventure, by the way. That doesn't qualify for this list because it was direct to video. Uh, but Pooh's Grand Adventure is, in my opinion, the quintessential Winnie the Pooh movie. I watched it a ton as a kid. It's from 1997, uh, the movie where Christopher Robin goes to Skull, or school, and they all have to go find him. It's like, actually really creepy, especially if you're like five or six years old. But it's so engrossing and emotional. It's beautiful. It's actually a musical, too. There's actually like some singing. This one is also a musical as well. Zoe Deschanel come in and do some of the singing. <laughs> Um, 
Peter Pan, a classic from the Silver Age, one that has aged probably the worst besides Song of the South, but that's not fully Disney animation. So if we're just talking about these 62 films, boy, has Peter Pan aged the worst out of the bunch. Uh, the whole Native American section could be, you know, taken out. But for history, it is still included on Disney Plus with a lot of precursors, which I think is right. Um, you know, I, I think I have this pretty much smack dab in the center of what I think a good Disney film is without being exceptional. Peter Pan has the workings and the building blocks to what makes Disney and, and echoes of what makes Disney so special. Um, the music is almost there. The animation is almost there. The story is almost there. I mean, obviously, Peter Pan is working off of an IP that we're all a little more familiar with, though. Granted, it still was made mostly popular by this film. Um, but the novel had been already very famous. There's so much you can do with it. I mean, Captain Hook is one of the best villains. Uh, but I don't know. The 2003 Peter Pan from uh, Universal Studios, I think is better. I think it's a better version of the story. Definitely the Peter Pan and Wendy Disney live action uh, is nowhere near on the level of either of these. Uh, Peter Pan has been done to death. We don't really need to do more Peter Pan. There's also the 1992 Robin Williams comedy Hook. So I haven't seen that version. But um, yeah, Peter Pan is a solid film. We've all probably seen it. We've all sort of been captivated by the wonder and whimsy of it. Um, and laughed along. It's a fun adventure, problematic in parts. Uh, you know, Peter Pan, as one reviewer pointed out, is a little bit of an a-hole. He's not the best with women, uh, and uh, he's very impatient, and um, you're trying to root for him, but, you know, <laughs> you're kind of like, you, you're kind of annoying. Um, anyway, Wendy Darling really needs to school him. <laughs> Okay, so Sword in the Stone. Boy, am I going to catch a lot of flack for ranking it this high. 33. Oh, boy, people are not a fan of this film. I see it consistently ranked in the bottom five, definitely the bottom 10. I think if you go in thinking, I'm excited to watch a King Arthur story, you're going to be set up for failure. This is not really a King Arthur story. This is very much a Merlin story and sort of an anthology story of fun animated shorts that teach you kind of serviceable elementary lessons about life. I think that if you go into it with that in mind, you will probably enjoy this more. Um, yeah, because the, the whole plot doesn't really get realized till the very end, and then it's very rushed and anticlimactic. Most of this story is Arthur or Wart when he's a young boy getting transformed into different animals by Merlin to be taught different lessons. And uh, it reminds me so much of Redwall and Brian Jacques' novels. Um, it's very much in conversation with the sort of animation style from those animated versions of those books and the anthropomorphic animal kind of angle of medieval England. Merlin is steals the show along with Archimedes, the owl, and Mad Madam Mim. I think everyone agrees that the Mad Madam Mim section, which is completely bonkers and completely out, out of context with the rest of the film, leaps and bounds better than everything else. Is, this the best, is it the best animation? No. Is the voice acting on Wart super cringe? Because this character, the, they literally change the voice actor for this little boy, not once, but twice, because his voice kept changing. And he'll literally change his voice in, in one scene. There'll be like a different voice speaking the voice of young Arthur in the same scenes. It's like absolutely wild. And I didn't even pick up on it until someone pointed it out to me because as a kid, like you just go with it. You're just like, yeah, that sounds like a completely different person. Like he went through puberty or like, you know, his voice is, is just different, but like he's growing at the same time, like in the story. Right. But he's meant to be like a prepubescent boy. Anyway, it's, yeah, it's, it's so, it's so slapdash and kind of messy on the edges, but it's got a lot of heart. It's got a lot of character. Um, and, I, I I don't know. The music is not as unmemorable as some people say. It doesn't have any musical numbers, but it has some motifs that get repeated a little bit throughout that were very stuck and very catchy in my head as a child. So 
I enjoyed this film and this was one of those like classics for me that I wanted to watch over and over again. I didn't own this on VHS, but I wished I did. Again, I'm, you know, if I'd never seen this movie until the year of our Lord 2024, I might be like, eh, I might view it a little bit more like Robin Hood. But where this one is better than Robin Hood for me, I just think that there's more dynamic kind of environments and exploration of setting. Um, Robin Hood is is very much a straightforward in a castle and a forest, and we're doing this caper. This is like in the water, in the air, crazy Madame Mim, uh, you know, a cabin in the forest. I mean, it's all over the place. And this film just kind of like doesn't let a tree in the forest. I kind of love that this film is just like a bunch of shorts stitched together, and it keeps my attention. <laughs> Speaking of rough animation, uh, the Wolfgang Reitherman films, yeah, they really love that sketchy, you know, uh, that sketchy style, which, you know, I think has its merits for especially more like uh, city-based movies. I think movies that are based in an urban environment with that, you know, contrasting the urban, like, harsh edges, having it be so sketchy gives it this frenetic energy that evokes the type of, like, time period, which obviously this is meant to be, like, 1940s, 1950s London and 101 Dalmatians. Um, it, it kind of, it gives you that feel. It's very jazzy. I call it jazzy animation. 101 Dalmatians is a classic that is beloved by many, and it is the perfect, safe, middle-of-the-road Disney film here, as, as, as per its ranking. Cruella de Vil. Now, you might be, like, checking my channel and saying, look at that last name. Is it pronounced de Vil? Yes, my last name is pronounced like Cruella. I had that wonderful... Uh, honor of growing up being named, oh, Arthur DeVille, like Cruella. Yes, yes. It's been so wonderful having that thrown around all my life. Uh, and yes, devil is, is you know, uh, you know, uh, short for the devil, which makes me feel great about my last name, even though it's actually French. It means de vie of the town. Uh, but, you know, that was where they were going with this. I mean, Cruella, though, is the best villain by far of probably any Disney. I mean, she's the most unapologetically evil, especially for the context of modern times, you know, you've got like your ancient medieval sorceresses, but they're in this context of like witchcraft and sorcery and being evil in that regard. But Cruella is like modern day evil because she just selfishly like wants to murder puppies and wear their fur. It's not even entirely about the money. It's just about like her fetish for it. Um... And it's just so compelling as like a us versus them story. And so it's what the Aristocats was sort of lacking. Uh, it's just a very clear protagonists to root for that, you know, are really thrown for a loop and having to escape and find their way back home. It's it's a real caper. It's a real nail biter at parts. Um, yeah, I don't know what else to say. Uh, it's charming. It's got, you know, um, that iconic song. Uh, there's a lot to love about this film. The Jungle Book is a movie that I think opens more and more with the more you sit with it. I think as a kid, because it was another one of the VHSs we always owned, I watched it a ton, but I never was like madly in love with it. I, I enjoyed it, but it wasn't my favorite. And now that I've seen it as an adult and in high definition, I am just absolutely in awe of those jungle backdrops uh, and also the character designs. Um, I think that there's something really, really special. This was the last movie that Walt Disney really oversaw because it came out right after his death. Um, and uh, it definitely has much crisper animation. Um, so, you know, we're, we're leagues, the budget is a lot higher than where we were with 101 Dalmatian and Sword in the Stone. Um, and it is just such a, uh, compelling story, uh, that again, some potentially problematic depictions. I don't really think it's, I was a little surprised when I saw the disclaimer. I was like, what could that be referring to? That's a conversation for another video. Uh, I think a lot of people, um, Perhaps what I love the most about it is the fact that, not to spoil it, but at the end, Mowgli does go and live with humans. I think it's so important that Mowgli does that because it just doesn't make sense for him to spend the rest of his life living with bears and a panther. It just doesn't make sense. <laughs> but, uh, you know, Baloo is everyone's uh, favorite teddy bear. 
um, yeah, just so much, so much heart and charm and uh, soul in this film that really kind of comes off the page with some really interesting score as well. The Rescuers is another movie like Sword in the Stone that I see constantly uh, crapped on by most reviewers. And so I am here to set the record straight that I do not think The Rescuers gets as much love as it should. Uh, I have seen people aptly praise the opening sequence, which are these gorgeous pastels of waves crashing in a harbor and the sea and the ocean, uh, sung by Shelby Flint singing this song called Who Will Rescue Me? I just, I wish this soundtrack was on Apple Music. It's, it's not, uh, but you know, I would buy the soundtrack. This has some gorgeous music. The Rescuers also has a really haunting villain. Madame Medusa is up there with Cruella de Vil in terms of being so sinister and sort of, uh, in a modern setting, being so cruel, especially to children, the way she treats Penny is just hard to watch, especially as a child. Um, she's so despicable and also such a, you know, um, hilarious caricature in the way she's animated that you just can't help but be enamored. Um, but I do really think that Bianca and Bernard are so, I mean, it's a 70s movie. It's, it's, you can tell there's not a lot of budget. But if you go past that, I think there's so much charm to this film. And there's so much to root for with Bianca and Bernard and, and even Rude. Uh, you know, I, I think that there's something very haunting about this film. Um, it's, it's very much a nighttime kind of sleeper uh, stealth movie. And it's not very flashy. And it's a bit different for a kind of Disney. And uh, it, it's, it's, it really puts, you know, as a child, it's not hard to watch, but it, the way that Penny, the, the, the positions that Penny is put in, it, it really, I don't know, as a kid, it was just hard to watch. But I also, it's like, I was so into it. It was so creepy and so good. I love the, you know, go into the, the, the lair and have to get the, the diamond from the skull. Um, it was such a creepy sequence as a kid, but it's always stuck with me. Um, just like those opening, you know, melody lines of the, uh, of the instrumental uh, and that kind of uh, eerie kind of bayou ambiance that it sort of lingers in the backgrounds. Give this one a try. Give this one a shot, please. If you don't like it, I understand, but I see it crapped on so much. And uh, I think that out of all of the sort of animal keeper movies, uh, this one is still kind of the quintessential one for me. Treasure Planet is such a sad story for Disney in their history. Um, Treasure Planet was done so dirty by the animations, by the uh, by the heads at Disney, by the way they uh, they dropped it and just didn't promote it. Pretty much expected and wanted it to to fail. It was the most significant box office fail, um, at least in the modern Disney era. Uh, it was the only film. Uh, well. If you count Fantasia 2000, Fantasia 2000 was kind of never meant to be quite as big of a box office hit. Uh, it was the only film in the 2000s to not hit 100 worldwide. Um, and it was such a loss for the studio that John Musker and Ron Clements, which is, it was their dream project. They'd been trying to work on it for so long. And the studio in the meantime was like, well, okay, if you give us, if you give us Hercules, we'll give you this. So they put out Hercules and then they were like, please let us work on our passion project. Um, this, this is such a beautiful, beautifully animated and real life film. There's a sub CGI blending with gorgeous, you know, hand-drawn. Um, it's, uh, based on Treasure Island, but set in the sky with spaceships as, uh, sailing ships, which is a really fun steampunk aesthetic, futuristic, colonial aesthetic. Um, there's so much here that could be better explored. Like Raya and the Last Dragon, I feel like it only touches the surface, and I do feel like a sequel would be beneficial, or more importantly, a live-action retelling. I am itching and chomping at the bits to see Treasure Planet given a live-action. Um, there's one more movie I'd rather see over this one from the animated canon, but I would still love to see Treasure Planet get it, and it deserves it. It would be so much more fully fleshed out and realized. It's such a heartwarming story. I mean, my, um, Jim Hawkins uh, and and that that and uh, the villain who at the beginning you think is actually someone who is potentially going to work with him and then betrays him, 
and you know he's looking for a father figure it's it's really really bittersweet really heart-wrenching and but there's also all the ingredients for a fun kind of kooky movie i mean i will say that i think um you know the robot character maybe he's introduced a little too late into the film um didn't do as much for me uh it, i think robin williams does the voice of the robot um the robot felt kind of unnecessary to the story, but uh, you wanted some kind of character sidekick. But having it come in so late in the film was a little bit like, oh, OK. But yeah, I, I've only seen this one a few times. I saw it once as a kid and I was like, it's OK. Uh, but then rewatching it as an adult now, I've seen it twice and I, I really get the hype. And it is uh, such an expansive film that I think is a perfect example of Disney trying to make a film that's not a musical and pulling it off. This, this is one of the few examples of that that I feel strongly about. Disney can avoid musicals, though there is a lot of music involved. Um, Trent Reznor uh, of the Goo Goo Dolls provides beautiful uh, pop rock you know, anthems for all of the emotional moments, very Tarzan-esque, where again, it's diegetic or non-diegetic non-diegetic. Uh, the music is played over the emotion. It's, it's really heart-wrenching. It's really heart-stirring. Now, speaking of Fantasia 2000, uh, this was a something of, this was a passion project of Roy E. Disney. Um, he really, you know, wanted to make sure that uh, a legacy film to celebrate Fantasia came out around the millennium. I only watched it really as an adult, and I think that uh, it has so much to live up to that it's always going to potentially look a little derivative or not as strong. I think that there are some gorgeous sequences to it. Um, my absolute favorites uh, would be involving the floating whales. Um, I forget what that sequence is called. Kinds of Rome. Uh, it's uh, such a surreal and... Uh, spiritual kind of movement and represents the idea of music and image being blended together so beautifully, uh, as well as the George Gershwin Rhapsody in Blue New York Al Hirschfeld caricature set. Uh, this is very much a jazz in, you know, the style of illustration and also in the instrumentation and music story uh, in, and, and done beautifully. There is a repeat of The Sorcerer's Apprentice from the 1940 version. I understand including it again because it's like every version of Fantasia should have it, but I kind of feel like why not do something new? But, you know, it's fine. Um, and then the Firebird Suite by Stravinsky uh, is this mystical sprite, uh, you know, who is um, swallowed up by a fire spirit and almost loses completely the spark of life. And finally, um, at the end, in the very stirring moment in the movement, finds the, you know, magic to blanket the world in green and light again. And it's just such a beautiful tale of obstacle, uh, overcoming obstacle, and beautiful landscape imagery to go with it. Uh, so there is some real painting on a wall, kind of really pa real painterly uh, auteur, uh, you know, animation, always, as always, being put for this sort of showcase, because that's what Fantasia is. It's not about so much narrative. And I like that. I'm not someone who needs narrative. I just like visual. I like the trippy surrealism of it. Music and visual together can create such a wonderful mesmerizing package. This one also has, you know, in the original Fantasia, it's just one man introducing each number. This one has every huge celebrity you could think of. We've got Quincy Jones. We've got Steve Martin. We've got Ben Mittler, Angela Lansbury. They all introduce their own segment. And I think it's a great idea. I think it's a wonderful way to honor the tradition of how the original was done but make it a little bit more of an exciting event for, you know, what this film was. And this was, you know, coming out right before the millennium. It came out in December of 1999. It was released in limited theaters, so it didn't have a full theatrical run um, before, I believe, it's getting straight, sent straight to video uh, because they knew this wasn't going to be a commercial hit. You know, this was that, there was a reason the studio had been like, Roy, do we really need to do this? The Disney felt comfortable enough coming off of the Renaissance that they could put this out. And I'm glad they did. I hope that maybe one day we can get maybe, you know, a Fantasia 2030, 2040, 2050, maybe 2050. That's a bit far away. I hope I'm around by then. I would love to see it. <laughs> We 
we come to the quintessential film that started it all, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. I'm going to keep this brief because so many people have talked about this film. So much of what makes this film memorable and important is the fact that it's the first. But if you take away the novelty of how amazing and beautiful this film is for its time, how impressive it was as a feat of, you know, uh, artistic rendering and engineering on film, this is a bit of a hollow story. There's a lot of there's a lot of filler of dwarves getting high, having a party. There's a lot of cleaning. There's, I mean, there's a whole segment where the dwarves are washing their own beards. And you realize that this shtick is going to get compared like seven times and you're just like, okay, I'm going to fast forward through this because I don't need to see this done. Like the dwarves get old. The dwarves get old. I wish you could see a little bit more of the evil queen. There's obviously some narrative problems. Uh, but at the end of the day, it is absolutely visually breathtaking. It finally got a 4K remaster. Um, but even then, you know, the, the HD versions that have come out have been so beautiful to look at. Um, the scene in the forest was always so terrifying to me as a child. Like I was very young watching it and it was just so scary. Uh, but I loved it. I kept wanting to go back. It was like a, it was like a, it was like a roller coaster that was thrilling me. Kept wanting to go back on. Um, and, uh, yeah, there's just nothing more pure Disney than like what Snow White is and represents. Uh, and I think number 27 is, is, it's the highest I can place it at the end of the day. And I was debating putting it possibly a little lower because the story really does drag, but then the conclusion is very soft and very, you know, the conclusion is very beautiful. Um, and at the end of the day, I think 27, I feel pretty good about it. Pocahontas. This is a tough one. Boy, what a minefield of a movie to talk about. I have seen some people rank this, including one ranking, putting this, at, I believe, the second to worst Disney animated film. And I almost shut my computer because I was just like, are you seriously serious? You're going to put Pocahontas as the 61st worst, 61st worst Disney animated film. I just can't take you seriously. I'm sorry. You clearly didn't grow up with it. If you didn't grow up with it, you're going to maybe think of it that way. Pocahontas is, an, is a lesson for Disney in straying a little too far into reality to mytholo mythologize a character, a particularly a POC character that at the time felt revolutionary and for representation, but I think history has looked at not as favorably. Turning Pocahontas and her story, which was very real, but also very tragic and very problematic, you know, uh, and turning it into this 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 colonizer colonizee romance that um, is probably not the most helpful uh, progressive viewpoint to have for how to run the story. Um, you know, I have a lot of mixed feelings because I can't completely separate the art. Uh, I can separate the art somewhat from the the context of the story and say, like, if you take away the context, if Pocahontas were completely figurative made up person and this whole environment and narrative and imperialism in the UK wasn't so like on the nose I think you could say that this is an absolutely beautiful story romance um beautiful romance now I mean the things that definitely sell this film are the music and the animation uh the music I think most people agree is is top tier colors of the wind is one of the best Disney songs um and just like just like the river just uh just around the river bend. Um, you know, Vanessa Williams has a beautiful end credit version. Shout out to If I Ever Knew You as well. That's a beautiful motif that's used in the film that's sung at the end credits by these uh these two RB singers. It's really touching. The opening sequence, Steady is the beating drum. I mean, goosebump inducing. The animation, I mean, first of all, you know, Virginia, the parts of Virginia that this would be set in probably would never look this gorgeous. Uh, they make they make the forests look so tall and the mountains so so giant, um, but this is absolutely the most gorgeous you know kind of um, vistas that you could get of like forest landscapes and sunrises and sunsets, absolutely mesmerizing. But then you have the dialogue, and then you have the story of John Smith meeting Pocahontas, and it is very you know um, convenient how he suddenly learns her language. And they can communicate because of Grandmother Willow. And then 
how easily she sort of falls in love with him. And it becomes, I mean, I still think to this day that there is still such important messages about unity uh, across racial divides. I mean, at the end of the day, that's the ultimate conflict. Pocahontas throws herself in front of, you know, from her own father. And that causes, you know, uh, the, the whole dynamic to shift between these two warring groups. Um, and then, of course, Ratcliffe, who is the ultimate villain, is the one who still can't get it. And he has to be taken care of by, you know, all the other English colonists, settlers realizing, you know what, we can let's let's listen to what this 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 native person is saying. Um, but, you know, and it's sort of true to some accounts of the story. There are elements to it. The, the, the narrative historic historical narrative about Pocahontas is very fascinating. Um but I will say that what's really kind of distressing is the Powhatans who are based, you know, Pocahontas is from the Powhatan tribes. They weren't as involved in the creative storytelling and uh, in the process of the film. And they were they were trying to, you know, be included in the story, but they were trying to have their voice heard, but they weren't given that opportunity. And that's where, you know, we see today. Um, filmmakers doing more to like have the actual groups that these films are are about have their input, have them actually you know lead the charge in creating the vision for how their own people will be represented on screen because it's so important. It, you know, otherwise you have damaging stereotypes. Um, again, this is leaps and bounds from what we see in Peter Pan, but. This is still the 90s. The conversation around representation has not moved to the space it is now. Um, everyone was applauding, you know, Disney for, at the time, thinking it was it was doing something really progressive and modern. But perhaps, you know, they opened more of a can of worms than they realized. Because in retrospect, it could have been done in a more um, considered way. I think it's also having Mel Gibson, for, you know, voice... Um, John Smith is quite ironic considering how Mel Gibson ends up turning out with his political views and everything. Um, I think it's very interesting that the team behind this were very much thinking this was going to be Oscar bait and it ended up being the Lion King that they were working on at the same time that ended up getting all the prizes and the nominations. The only thing Disney uh, Pocahontas got recognized for is its music, which it understandably deserved. Alan Menken did his thing. Alan Menken is God, you know, is the God composer of Disney. Um, this is the first Alan Menken scored film to come up on this list. But, you know, I, I again, I, I, I don't think this film is harmful. I think that, you know, it's a conversation starter. And I think that Disney has learned its lesson. I, I think Disney for a while was actually really ashamed of this film and they weren't really promoting it. I do think it is one of the only animated films that Disney has ever made that they will never do a live action version of. I think they're just too afraid. They're too afraid, which I, I don't know. I, I get it. I think there's other stories. They shouldn't do this. But, you know, again, if they hired indigenous people from that region to tell it, I mean, I don't see how that could not be potentially good. But, you know, there already is The New World by Terrence Malick. And I think that's a much more historically accurate uh, and better depiction of the story. Um, although I will say, I will say, I see a lot of people giving Disney flack for things that the Terrence Malick film does similarly that I don't see getting the same sort of, I, uh, you know, for instance, the fact that the Terrence Malick film kind of brushes over the sexual um, assault side of Pocahontas' story. Uh, you know, obviously Pocahontas is like 12 years old when she meets John Smith. And um, the fact that we think of it as a romance is very much from one man's perspective. We don't really know actually how it went down. More often than not, it was not consensual. It was not as romantic as even the new world points it out to be. So that's a critique you could have for that film as well. That is still a romanticized version of the story, but it is much more historically accurate. Um, actually, Pocahontas 2, Journey to a New World, is the even more historically accurate version of the Pocahontas story because it actually has John Rolfe come in and how she goes to the UK and visits King James. But it's not as regarded as strong critically. And, you know, it's not an amazing Disney sequel. I don't think it's the worst Disney sequel, but it is certainly no um, Lion King 2 or, you know, some of the other really strong Disney sequels that we have out there. Most of them are not. Her 
Hercules. Uh, this one, I think, is very beloved by most and a really great example of Disney not taking itself too seriously, yet still actually creating a product that I think is memorable, classic, um, noteworthy. It has great music, all of the right elements. It has great animation. Um, the muses being, you know, uh, gospel singers is probably the best creative decision that they could have ever made for this film. Alan Menken uh, really, again, is just glowing with all of these scores that he composes, all of the songs with David Zippel. Uh, and I, I really think that uh, Hercules is deserving of being one of the most beloved Disney films for most people. Uh, it's not perfect. Uh, it has a really fun villain, Hades, Danny DeVito, uh, as Phil is just uh, magnetic on screen. Um, Hercules is everyone's Disney boyfriend. <laughs> uh, Hercules, I will confess, you know, if I had to rank Disney characters by uh, attractiveness, I mean, Hercules would always be the one. Um, and uh, I don't know. I, I think that uh, I think Megara is a really interesting uh, protagonist, sort of damsel in distress character. Um, she's a little bit more meta than the typical Disney princess that we get. And she has a little bit more of a modern reflection on love and life, which is a little refreshing. Um, and the snarkiness uh, is kind of endearing. A lot of people have pointed out that this movie has a lot of kind of meta commentary on uh, popular athletes and sponsorship deals. And I can see that parallel, that kind of um, uh, dialogue that the film is trying to engage with. And I think, I think done right, a live action retelling of this with the Disney music, you know, uh, not just fully, fully making it like there's been a bunch of Hercules films that are trying to be a lot more dramatic and just kind of like epic battle movies. And I feel like if they did it with the right kind of creative vision, they could make a really fun, uh, a re magnetic uh, updated 2020s version uh, in live action. But I have very little faith that if Disney does ever actually get this live action remake off the ground, it's been in development hell for like so long now uh, that I'm not actually sure it's actually ever going to happen. Um, but one thing's for sure, if whoever they cast as Hercules, they need to be at least under the age of 35. Um, I've seen some names floating around and I'm just like, they are too old. They are too old. Maybe a decade ago, they could have been Hercules. But we need someone preferably who is under 30, uh, but at least 30. Like, we can't be going much older than that for someone playing that role. I just don't quite understand so many people throwing out. Hollywood seems to not be wanting to cast newcomers in some of these roles. So I would just caution that. <laughs> Okay, so The Black Cauldron is the other much maligned film from Disney's catalog that a lot of people forget exists, or that it's Disney, that I've seen so many videos, video after video, taking a dump on. And I am here to set the record straight that, in my opinion, The Black Cauldron is the 24th best Disney animated feature film. And I stand by that. I thought long and hard about where I was going to place this movie. And I know I'm placing it way higher than almost any other reviewer I've ever seen, but I don't care. I do have an affinity for this film from childhood, and that does play a big part in it. But I am also a visual person before anything else. And I think the visuals for this film do so much to sell it that even if you forgive the plotting plot lines, the, you know, forgettable characters... I think that this film still shines as a beacon of something unique, different, and dark for Disney. This is the first Disney animated film to be rated PG, uh, and that was a big deal in the 80s. So the darkness, I mean, you could have even made a case for PG-13 at the time, especially by how conservative things were back then. Don Bluth had edited out a ton from how this movie might have actually looked. And of course, he was one of the animators. Um, Ted Berman and Richard Rich were the directors. Uh, and they were pretty, you know, intense. I'd love to see the extended edition of this movie. Um, this is adapted from a set of fantasy novels by Lloyd Alexander, uh, set in sort of a mythical Welsh landscape. 
Uh, and this one is predominantly based around the Black Cauldron. They are two of the um, Lloyd Alexander novels. There are five of them. And uh, Lloyd Alexander himself is actually from around my area. He was from Philadelphia. Uh, and I read all of these books in middle school. Uh, and I, because I was so enamored with The Black Cauldron, I was really interested in reading the other books of the Chronicles of Prydain that were published in the 60s. Um, the, the Black Cauldron is the most memorable because of this, but I could have, I would have loved to have seen Disney adapt all of these novels. And I really wish that Disney would maybe come back and revisit this or another studio, but Disney might still have the rights. I'm not entirely sure. Uh, so The Black Cauldron, um, has such beautiful, uh, rich, um, illustrative backgrounds that really pop with color and, and drama. I mean, the flashes of light and lightning that illuminate these dark, craggy, you know, uh, castle walls. I mean, it's so stark and, and, and so vibrant. Um, there's just such activated energy in all of the animation that is just absolutely gorgeous to look at. And you can tell that this film was expensive. The animation for this film nearly bankrupted the entire studio because unfortunately, this was one of the big flops. Uh, you could say, I mean, if you adjust for inflation, it's hard to say. You could say this was the most catastrophic Disney flop uh, financially for the company. Mainly because I think it was at a more precarious time for the studio. When Treasure Planet flopped, they at least had, you know, Lilo and Stitch the same year, which did really well. And they had the Renaissance behind them. They had some momentum. The company wasn't seriously going to be that much in trouble. But when the Black Cauldron flopped, it was like, uh-oh, we're already kind of not really cooking anymore. This might be the end of the company. And that was what ushered in the Michael Eisner era and a complete shift uh, focusing more on theme parks, focusing more on television. There was a whole shift in the in the push of the Disney, you know, VHS production. It was a whole, you know, much more merchandised kind of realm and era for Disney. And of course, also revitalizing the animation department was a part of that. And The Great Mouse Detective was, for all that I think Black Cauldron is a much more interesting film, The Great Mouse Detective is the one that got Disney back on its feet. But The Black Cauldron understandably was probably not a crowd pleaser at the time. It was so different from all the other Disney movies they'd made. It's very much a different kind of realm of fairy tale, even though it's in a similar setting to what you'd see in a fairy tale like The Sword in the Stone. It's just such a dark story that it's not a musical. Uh, it doesn't have ab any musical elements. Um, and it, it really, it can be difficult for some audiences. So I think that, uh, although I think it's mostly beloved now, a lot of people critique that it has the most forgettable characters. A lawn we is, is very van bland and vanilla. Um, the, uh, the bard who accompanies them, very bland and vanilla. The Gurgi character, who is the small animal creature. I don't know why everyone hates on Gurgi, but I was obsessed with Gurgi as a child. Uh, Gurgi is the favorite. Gurgi is the glue of this film. Uh, he's just this little, you know, little munchkin and he's so adorable and his voice is so cute. Um, and how, why, why are people not responding to Gurgi? I don't quite understand. I can understand the other characters. Uh, the Horn King is one of the creepiest protagonists. He doesn't have enough screen time, but he definitely, when he is on screen, is terrifying, uh, especially for a Disney film. Um, and I think the sacrifice that Gurgi makes, I mean, it makes the whole stakes of the film feel really emotive and heart, you know, uh, heart racing. So I, I don't have a problem. And remember, this is the Lloyd Alexander novel we're critiquing if we want to come for the plot, though Disney could have done more with it. I also love the three witches and how they are these sort of, they're a continuation of what they were doing with Madame Mim. I feel like they more fully fleshed out the sort of Madame Evil Witch character and did a really great job with the three witches. So I, again, I just, I find it really hard to, to buy when people say that there is not much to this, but some pretty pictures. I mean, yes, there are some gorgeously animated scenes, but overall it's a really mystifying, dark, eerie, mysterious, uh, you know, entrancing story with some heart. Gurgi provides so much of the heart. And without Gurgi, this movie falls flat. And I will stand by that. Taron, Taron is fine. Taron's somewhat likable because he has a little bit more backstory to him. Uh, I always was a Taron fan because, you know, I was always like the Harry Potter archetype, the Aragon archetype, like 
little, you know, teenage boy who has to go on an adventure, you know, into a mystical world. That was like where I was wanting my stories to go. So I always kind of identified, but I, 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 I don't know. I just think that people are so harsh on this movie. And I think it's also because of its box office failure. It's just easy to dunk on it. Um, but no, Black Cauldron deserves a live action. I would love to see it. I would love to see maybe not Disney, but another studio adapt the Chronicles of Prydain novels. Uh, similarly to, you know, how we're now getting a Chronicles of Narnia series from Netflix. I would really love to see maybe in different studio. It doesn't have to be Netflix, maybe HBO, um, maybe even Amazon, though Amazon, you know, their track record. Uh, we'll see. I would like to see the Chronicles of Prydain get another shot at an adaption because this is only scratching the surface. There's a city way down on the river. All right, at 23, we have The Princess and the Frog. I only recently saw this movie for the first time around the pandemic. So I didn't grow up with this movie. Um, again, it came out while I was in high school, so I just wasn't really paying attention. Uh, but it had a lot of press around it because of the fact that it was, at the time, kind of being billed as the last gasp for 2D animation at Disney. Meanwhile, Winnie the Pooh was still coming, but Winnie the Pooh, judging by the box office and judging by how little that movie was promoted, that and all the fact that it wasn't like a big fairy tale musical princess movie, that was clearly not really the aim for the market here. The Princess and the Frog also is the first time we see a African American character protagonist depicted in such a positive central role. This film is set in New Orleans in you know the early twentieth century, and um, it is imbued with Creole culture uh, and Cajun culture. And uh, I think I really appreciate the film for just spotlighting that and more kind of better fleshing that out. You know, The Rescuers was technically also set in the bayou of Louisiana, but that setting was really much, that was just a backdrop. There was nothing culturally tying it in. Whereas this film is so much about, it lays so into the Creole and Cajun cultures of that area with voodoo, with uh, the food, the beignets. I think this film does a great job for representation, except for the fact that once again, we turn our protagonists into animals, our two POC protagonists into animals for the majority of the film. Yes, it is a retelling of the Princess and the Frog story. And of course, both of them end up turning into frogs because of the spell that's cast upon them by Dr. Facilier, who is a really strong villain. One of the better villains we've gotten, really menacing, dark, creepy, perfect villain. Uh, and one of the last we've gotten in the modern era that's, you know, truly dark. I guess Mother Gothel would have been from Tangled. Um, the music has really grown on me. My favorite is um, Mama Odie and her song, You Gotta Dig a Little Deeper. When I saw it for the second time, I was like, I get this. This is a jam. Mama Odie is the queen we don't, we, we don't deserve. Uh, Spitting facts, wisdom out the wazoo. Uh, and then, of course, Ma Belle Evangeline. Um, I'm forgetting the name of the Firefly character, but the Firefly character is the fallen warrior that, you know, um, truly steals the show in this film. Um, we all, you know, we talk about Dobby's death. I think the Firefly uh, reincarnating as a star, as a Firefly, it's just so touching and a callback to the Disney legacy of stars in the sky. So in some ways, Ray could have maybe been, although Wish is set hundreds of years before the events of Princess and the Frog, Ray could be like, you know, coming back as the embodiment of the star and helping out Asha and the Wish debacle. Um, so all in all, I mean, once they get into the swamp, it becomes a little Jungle Book. There's definitely some reminiscent Jungle Book-esque, you know, the character, uh, the crocodile reminds me so much of Baloo, um, as well as Timon, uh Pumbaa to a certain degree, Baloo and Pumbaa mixed together. Uh, so, you know, Disney will retread itself. But all in all, I mean, <laughs> the funniest thing for me is how, uh, again, I'm forgetting, I'm, I'm kind of bad with the names, but the blonde girl, the other, the white blonde debutante, how she calls her father Big Daddy, and she keeps going, oh, Big Daddy. I think that is just so disconcertingly strange. But anyway, uh, it's hilarious. Uh, this is a this is a class film. This is a very class film and uh, deserves to be remembered as kind of a continuation of the Renaissance. This would have deservedly fit amongst the 90s great films or even Cinderella or Sleeping Beauty. So I, I hold this film to high esteem.
Next, we have Zootopia. Uh, we are finally getting a sequel in 2025. We are going to get a sequel, and I think Zootopia is one of the best um, and most uh, deserving movies to give a sequel to because I feel like the first film barely scratched the surface surface of Zootopia. This is a care. This is an entire ecosystem of animals living together in a megalopolis, and they only barely explore all these different regions. Um, so we have, you know, Judy Hopps, the, uh, the cop who is trying to make a, make a name for herself, and Nick Wilde, the Red Fox con artist. Uh, and Jason Bateman and Jennifer Goodwin play wonderfully together. Um, it's not as good as I've seen people, like, hype it up to be. It does have a villain, twist villain reveal. I won't spoil it, but, you know, it doesn't have a traditional villain, which I don't mind, again, for this film. Um, this film is all about kind of an underlying mystery solving a crime. Um, and, you know, there are some strange, uh, you know, um, illusions being made to, not strange, there's some not so heavy handed illusions being made to race. Uh, although, again, similar to the elemental discourse, which, again, this movie is definitely giving more Pixar vibes. You would be not mistaken to believe that this was a Pixar film. Uh, because Elemental is, and there's a lot of there's a lot of similarity between the ideas of these two films, uh, using animals and discrimination against certain species as a metaphor for race works until it doesn't work until there becomes issues with well actually the truth is is that they are different species they are not just a different strain of the same race. Uh, like humans are. The idea of preys and predators, you've got certain species who are always going to be prey and certain species who are always going to be predators. Alluding that to racism has some merits, but I also think if you look at the animal kingdom, there is actual intrinsic biological thrust behind the reason why certain animals are prey and certain animals are predators. It's not the strongest allegory for racism in America or in the world. Uh, because in, 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 in sociology, there does not need to be prey and predator. But in the animal kingdom, the way that nature is thus, there is. And so it almost is sort of conflating divine ordinance with societal kind of creation and conflating the two to create this message. So I can see how that is a bit murky and some people side eye it to some degree. But again, if you don't think about it too much, it's... It's a serviceable allegory to tell for children. This is for children. It's, it's, a, it's a way to tell a parable to get them thinking. It's easy for them to understand. You just don't want to think too much into it. But this was a huge hit. This movie was like a mega hit um, for, the, for the studio. Ah, we come to Frozen. Uh, again, I was a little unsure where to place this film. I ultimately feel pretty good about almost making it into the top 20, but there are just so many good Disney films. I didn't watch Frozen until about 2015, so I was a little late to the party, and boy was this movie a party. Uh, this movie is the second highest grossing Disney animated film behind Frozen 2, uh, especially if you, you know, don't adjust for inflation. Um, so this is, this one is just a runaway hit. It was also a bit of a sleeper hit. I feel like it took all of, you know, the winter of 2014 for this movie to blow up like it did. And Let It Go was an everywhere song. Uh, we all remember Adele Dazeem performing it 10 years ago at the Oscars. Oh, I'm sorry. I mean, Adina Menzel. Uh, and honestly, I really, again, I was expecting to kind of think it was overrated when I finally saw it. But then I was like, you know what? Some of the music's a little overrated, but this is a solid movie. Uh, this is, this is, this is a great retelling of the Snow Queen by Hans Christian Andersen, a fairy tale. Uh, and they interestingly changed it to be called Frozen because they were wanting to get away from the whole princess queen fairy tale kind of thing with all their films. That's why Rapunzel became Tangled. The Snow Queen became Frozen. Um, and I also, I really like Olaf in this movie. I think he's the fun, dim-witted, you know, sidekick that this movie needed. Uh, even though Kristoff and Sven also provide that. There's, this is a great, you know, cornucopia of everything that Disney does right. You know, it's got silly stuff for the kids, but it's got stuff for the parents to enjoy for, you know, somewhat for girls and boys, though it's much more of a girl 
aimed movie. I would say this doesn't really have anything for boys. Uh, but, you know, Disney at its best is usually catered more towards girls. I think Disney really knows how to make good movies usually when it does that. Aladdin is, a, you know, Aladdin is an, an anomaly there. Um, but yeah, overall, uh, I don't really, it's got beautiful animation. It's one of the, you know, the, the crystals, just the animation sequences with all of the crystals and fractals of them created the ice, uh, you know, uh, siege, you know, the ice pyrotechnics, the isotechnics, I'm going to call it the opposite of pyrotechnics are so really beautifully realized on screen for the CGI. It's just, it's really impressive. So, um, and it has you know, a really um, extravagant story that's at once very relatable. I think most people can find, you know, within the story something to latch on to that they feel connected to. It does a really good job at being universal. Um, and uh, some fairy tales don't do that very well. This one does a really good job of it. When trend in the top 20, we have The Emperor's New Groove. I did not see this movie as a kid, which is absolutely bizarre because this was a huge hit and I was the perfect age for its release. I was watching every other Disney movie at, coming around this time, but I did not watch this one. I knew of it, but I didn't watch it. Um, I guess, you know, of course, we didn't end up buying it on VHS and we just never ended up renting it at the video store. And I guess my friend never had it at his collection. So I just never ended up seeing it. Um, but when I did finally watch it uh, a couple years ago, I got what all the hype was about. I was like, but people are saying a lot about this film. This is, you know, a really beloved, especially by Gen Z, like older Gen Z, really beloved film for them. Uh, and it is, it's, it's, it's screwball. It's Disney certainly not taking itself seriously. I definitely think that it is what Hercules was doing dialed up to a thousand. Only we subtract the Alan Menken score and the memorable music the music is really not the service. The music is not really the memorable part. It's not a musical, but it does have some musical-esque numbers. Um, Eartha Kitt as Yzma provides some of the best of that kind of uh, variety. But overall, and she definitely steals the show as the villain. But, but Cusco, you know, is, is a kind of annoying. He's meant to be annoying, but you end up rooting for him. The, the film does a good job at just tying everything together to make a mad dash kind of all over the place story that works. Um, and I also think it's interesting how they explore South America and the, and the Incan culture. It doesn't hit you over the head that this is meant to be like Machu Picchu, Peru. Uh, but I, I think it is important to, you know, have films that explore these different regions. And there hasn't been so much uh, exploration of, you know, Mayan or Incan or kind of those kinds of cultures in Disney film. And Pacha and, uh, well, I don't think Pacha and Cusco are as memorable a duo as Yzma and Kronk. Uh, but yeah, this, this film will make anyone young and old laugh and have a good time. Cinderella, Cinderella is maybe placed a little too high on this list. But you have to remember that it is Cinderella. It is sort of, even though Snow White was the quintessential first Disney princess film, I feel like Cinderella really gelled together what really is a Disney princess movie. This is the blueprint movie for so many to come after. And it owes, you owe it a lot of respect for that. Lady Tremaine and the two sisters are stealing the show along with, of course, the fairy godmother, Cinderella herself is relatable, fine, is a fine protagonist, but I think kind of gets swallowed up by these other characters. Where I do think the film strays a little bit is when it turns into a, you know, cat and mouse, she and scratchy show. If you've watched The Simpsons, I, it spends a little too much time with that. Though as a kid, and you know, this was one I grew up with, I didn't really mind it because it was catering to my age level. Uh, but as an adult, you sort of are like, okay, we spend a lot of time with the animals. You'd be forg forgiven to think that this wasn't about a cat named Lucifer a chasing Guscus, which is the cutest name for an animal in any film I've ever heard. Um, Guscus is just the perfect name. Uh, no, there's not really much else I can say. I, I think it's it's um, doing everything it needs to do to deliver a heartwarming wedding cake fairy tale movie, which I also think to this day has the best live action in-house Disney remake, Cinderella 2015 by Kenneth Branagh. That is the only Disney remake I feel that truly 
perhaps even elevates the original film. It takes the core of that film and embellishes it and still keeps it, you know, this epic Disney fairy tale, but elevates the story and makes it uh, melodically stronger with the music and in the costumes and everything. Um, so that's a, that's an example of when a live action remake is is deserved and actually improving upon the original. The Fox and the Hound is a movie that I think I slept on a lot as a kid. I just was like, oh, it's kind of silly. It's just a scampering animal movie. It didn't really do that much for me. But watching it as an adult every time has hit me like a sack of bricks, especially the last time I watched it. Um, Copper and Todd are, I think, the allegory for me of like every relationship I've ever had where I start out thinking like trepidatiously about us becoming friends and then it turns into this beautiful relationship. And then for whatever reason, I have to cut things off and then I ball my eyes out. And also there's a bit of an allegory for like childhood losing that and growing up. Um, because of course, you know, uh, Copper has to become a hunting dog and hunting dogs don't hang out with foxes. And so there is an allegory there about growing up. Uh, and how, you know, people you were best friends with as children, I mean, again, it'll tear me up to think about this, but this movie reminds me of like childhood friends that I had who I lost touch with because we became teenagers, because we grew up and our interests started to diverge. And we were just sort of not meant to stay friends in the next phase of our lives. And this film is sort of making a point of that. Um, and there's so many, so many wonderful layers to what is such a simple story. Uh, the scene where, you know, Todd is left alone in the forest by the grandmother character. I think by the last time I watched this, I had never cried more hysterically in a movie in recent in, in recent memory. I was I was inconsolable. Um, I think it didn't help that I've, you know, uh, I know someone who really, I don't know, reminds me of Todd. And I just kept viewing them through that lens. And it, it just, it oh, it just really, it just took me out took me out. I will say I do feel like um, the the fake out where you think that the one of the hunting dogs is going to end up dying for him to actually end up being okay. He just breaks his leg, ruins a little bit of the stakes of the movie. And I was a little bit like, oh, I forgot he didn't actually die. Because if he had, it would have completely added, it would have added so much weight to the story, which was simple on its own, added complexity to it. Um, you know, it's a children's movie and does everyone have to, does anyone really have to die on screen? Like anyone who's good, who does the right thing? Come on. No, I don't think so. Uh, so I won't critique it that, but this is, this is a strong, the animation is also really beautiful. Um, this is a strong entry from a time when Disney was really unsure of itself. You know, this film took a long time to finally get made. There was very little, you know, motivation at the studio and they they were like, I don't know if this company is going to survive. Um, and the Fox and the Hound didn't do terrible at the box office, but it certainly didn't instill confidence to move forward um, because it still took another four years for the Black Cauldron to come out. Uh, so, you know, the Fox and the Hound came out at a rough point for Disney. Uh, next, we have Tangled. I won't say too much other than I think Mother Gothel is one of the most brilliant villains um, that's truly unlikable that we haven't had so many of in recent years. It's probably the most recent, like, strong, strong Disney villain we've had. And uh, it's beautifully, beautifully rendered in computer animation. Um, a story that Disney always needed to adapt. They've been working on this one for a long time. Ten years they were trying to do a Rapunzel movie. Uh, I didn't want, I did watch it in college, actually. This one I did end up watching not long after it came out. Um, Flynn Rider, Flynn Rider is, a, is you know, uh, he's up there in the pantheon of attractive Disney princes. Let me just say that. Um, the music is probably, I will say, Alan Menken's weakest, but Alan Menken's weakest is still miles above pretty much the music of any of modern Disney's fare. So that's not Alan Menken. So he still, you know, does his thing. It's just some of the songs don't quite jump off the, jump off the page 
like they do for his his previous films. Um, Because this is the last time Alan Menken actually worked on a full Disney animated uh, feature film and not a live action remake. Uh, Yeah, Tangled is is uh, sort of the the 21st century version of Cinderella. Um, All right, Atlantis. Uh, This one I did love as a kid. I love the whole mythology of it. This is probably the most untapped potential IP, if you could call myth and legend an IP. Uh, I guess you could in this content creator landscape we live in. Um, I think that uh, this film uh, was only scratching the surface at what they could do. I think they had a lot of ideas. Um, It's kind of, you know, this was the team behind Beauty and the Beast. Um, And I feel like, you know, perhaps Musker and Clements would have been better suited for this. Uh, But they still did a great job. Musker and Clements were a little bit more about that adventure and a little bit more boy centric kind of story. Um, but you know, for all it is, for all it might be, you know, Atlantis, I mean, they also did Hunchback of Notre Dame, these, these directors. So they were, they have a history of doing some of the best Disney films ever. And Atlantis is their weakest, but it is still, I mean, it's number 16. Um, so, uh, I wish this was a musical. I think Atlantis could have really used some music. Um, whereas I understand sort of why Treasure Planet didn't, but at the same time, I understand the complete sci-fi approach. I just think that these two directors are so used to doing musicals that if they had been thinking in the musical lane, they might have been better, you know, able to do it. But they weren't thinking about potential Broadway shows. They weren't thinking, they were thinking this is a James Cameron sci-fi story. And it is, it does. It kind of goes off of that. There's an influence from a lot of sci-fi movies, Alien, The Abyss. Um, uh, uh, there's so much, uh, influence there. And, um, I think that there's so much build up to the point where you get to Atlantis. It's a little bit of a letdown because the story then kind of immediately shifts to, you know, the, the, the villain reveal. And it's kind of all a little bit rushed. Um, there isn't time to really like sit in the world of Atlantis because you spent so much time thinking if it's, if it's, if it's, if it's even real, um, and just wondering what it might be like. It's this huge like shadow cast over the movie and you know Milo's reputation is entirely staked on it and then we thrust that aside for him to save the princess and it becomes you know a saving the people's kind of story kind of like a Pocahontas story which again I can understand going that route I mean the colonizer colonizee story is a tale as old as time when you have people discovering new places why not go that route? Keep in mind, this movie is sort of meant to be set more like in the early 20th century. So it's not set in modern times, which uh, I also think was an interesting choice. Um, And so overall, I think that uh, I have a lot of fond memories for this film that will always like hold it up high for me. Um, But I do think that uh, I think in a live action retelling is begging to be made. There is so much you can do with this story and the animated version was just like a prototype we need the live action this is what's so frustrating about the current situation at disney with live action films they're constantly choosing films that did really well at the box office and are perfect as they are they do not need to be retold where you've got films like atlantis which yeah didn't do great i mean atlantis did a teeny bit better than treasure planet i think that's just because it came out in the summer rather than in the fall but, uh, you know, Atlantis struggled. It was it was a similar, I mean, Atlantis to Treasure Planet was just like, it was bad for Disney. Um, but, you know, I also feel like Michael Eisner was just not interested in making these movies have their moment, you know? And, and so I, I honestly think Lilo and Stitch being a hit was kind of a fluke because even that movie, I don't think he was really aiming. I mean, there was a lot more promotion for that one. Uh, but overall, I love the cast of characters. I love the ensemble of characters. There's such great diversity. Um, such great characters to work off of. And there's just so much here. And so I highly recommend Atlantis if you've never seen it. Every single movie I'm talking about at this point, it's like you gotta see. These are like once in a lifetime, you gotta view kind of movies. Encanto is a miracle in the modern Jennifer Lee era of Disney. And I really hate harping on Jennifer Lee because I know she is the first woman to ever head Disney animation, 
But I don't think Jennifer Lee, and based on what people are saying uh, behind closed doors, that Jennifer Lee is not the right fit. Um, and so Lin-Manuel Miranda and Byron Howard and Jared Bush really came up with something magical here. Uh, and so I'm really impressed that this movie uh, unfortunately came out at a bad time, but still was able to be such a huge hit on streaming. This movie opened for only about a month in theaters in the COVID, it was like a little post COVID, but still kind of the COVID era. And then immediately went to Disney Plus and was one of the first big Disney Plus hits for the studio. And I do think that had COVID not happened, this film would have done pretty good at the box office. Columbia is explored so richly and textually and familial relationships in the Latin American culture. It's just such a great tapestry. I, I don't know what else to say. Um, the story doesn't really go where I thought it would go. Like the first time I saw it, I was like a little bit like, okay, we're getting very esoteric here, like with Bruno. But all in all, the pictures come together. Um, I mean, the, the idea, again, of a one person in the family not getting special powers while all your siblings do, that is such a pivot, poignant story for Disney to tell. I think it is just Mirabelle is, represents so much. Um, she, there's a lot of conceptual weight there, and they do a great job representing it. All that being said, I do feel like the fact that, you know, at the end of the film, the, fil the house comes down and then you see them trying to rebuild. I think it would have mean, been a richer story if they had to, if they no longer had their magic and they had to rebuild the house their, themselves, um, it would have, I think, served the metaphor better. Uh, but instead, the house just, as soon as they all start getting, you know, the forgiving each other, you know, the grandmother forgives the daughter, the granddaughter, and there's this like familial healing, the candle starts to light up again and the whole house comes healed and becomes, becomes whole. And, you know, again, it's a Disney ending. I wouldn't have chosen that route, but I might not be the best person to write for Disney. I'm a little too cynical sometimes. But uh, yeah, Encanto is, uh, the music is inescapable. I actually didn't love the music the first time because I'm just not a hugest Lin-Manuel Miranda fan. His stuff, his style is not for everyone, but I got it the second time around. I was like, these songs are catchy as hell, clever as hell. This is how you write great show tune slash pop songs that can serve us to radio really easily and straddle a bunch of genres, straddle Latin, hip hop, and Broadway. It does a great job at all of that. Uh, Tarzan is such a beloved movie for me. Uh, I will always have, you know, fond memories with this film as a kid. It was one of the ones we owned on VHS that I watched on and on and on. Um, the opening scene where he loses his parents, uh, any movie that started like that as a kid was like instant tearjerker. This was one of the first films to use a type of, uh, 3D animation where, you know, the characters, so like when Tarzan is like swinging on the vines and riding like a half line pipe, these trees, it was like one continual shot and they were able to do this really, I don't understand the technicals of it, but it was a really innovative form of 3D rendering of 2D drawing. And it's still a 2D film and it's still really beautifully 2D. But that extra level of dimensionality that they have with the cinematography really elevates those scenes. The scenes between Tarzan and Jane are so human and uh, you almost forget sometimes you're watching an animated film. I think the film does such a good job at capturing that awkward encounter. And all of the characters, even the even the gorilla characters we don't like, like Rosie O'Donnell's character. Yeah, she's, again, the silly kind of oafish sidekick, but she's fine to me. I don't have a problem with it. Every Disney movie's got to have it. Um, you know, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And uh, this movie just, it tells a really uh, endearing story. And and I, I love Jane and Tarzan's relationship. I love Jane trying to understand Tarzan's world and vice versa and the music, the music. It's similar to Tre Treasure Planet and Brother Bear where it is non-diegetic, meaning there's music, it's a musical, but it's more just soundtrack. There's not actual singing, except for one part where Glenn Close sings the main, main hook of You'll Be In My Heart at the early part of the film. Uh, really emotionally tugging uh, really emotionally talking that song just at the Oscars.
It's the third best original song. Uh, so Phil Collins definitely uh, and Mark Mancina do a phenomenal job scoring this film. And I, I don't have a problem with the music sort of guiding the viewer into the emotion. I think some people I've seen say it's a little bit of a cop-out, but I, I don't have a problem with it. The music's good. It works with the story. Love is a song that never Bambi is such a simple story. There's not a lot narratively here. And I see a lot of people admit that it is gorgeous to look at, but narratively so flat that it really drags the viewing experience. I understand where they're coming from. But did I mention I'm a visual artist? Did I mention I'm a visual person? The backdrops are some of the absolute top tier, most gorgeous of any Disney film. Uh, if I had to pick, you know, some Disney, uh, like, prints that I'd like to buy from stills of certain animated films, I would look at Bambi as one of them. For sure, some of the most beautifully painted and traditionally painted. I mean, you know, there's a real old world style to it. The watercolors and the oils just effortlessly capture the light of light in the forest. They have such depth and emotion. We all, of course, know that scene, that haunting scene uh, where Bambi loses his mother. And it'll hurt. It'll hurt every time. And that's what makes the film so moving. And then the film is also silly. And it's a little bit like kind of in the vein of the Mickey Mouse, you know, comedies, uh, cartoons that Walt was doing before. If you take it at the time, it was so revolutionary. And I just, for me, the parts where this film drag do not drag as badly as the parts where Snow White drag. Maybe because the visuals are a little more engrossing. But I don't have a problem with it. The thumper stuff, the, you know, um, the parts where Bambi is just exploring the forest. And that's the story. Sign me up. I mean, it's beautifully animated. Okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll be there. But then there is finding his father and growing up and taking his place as the king of the forest. It's such, a, it's such an elegant, classic story that you can't mess up. And Disney does a phenomenal job with it. Plus, it has some really beautiful music that's hella underrated. I kind of forgot the music as a kid watching it didn't stand out to me, but as an adult, I was like, whoa, this is, this is top tier music. Moana is the best modern Disney film. It's the highest, so I'm just gonna preface that, you know, this is the last post-2010 Disney film on this list. Uh, Moana, I'm going to get through this pretty quickly. Moana 2, I'm really curious to see how they stitch that TV show together. I'm a little worried, especially since it was originally meant to be a TV show. But again, I think Moana has ample room to explore. It's, you know, the Polynesian people of Tonga exploring the vast Pacific Ocean around them. There are so many islands. There are so many places for Moana to travel. Um, so why not give her another story? I don't think it's a bad idea to give them a sequel. I am really hoping that that Moana live action movie, though, by Dwayne Johnson that he's spearheading, I really hope that that falls through. I, I think, unfortunately, Dwayne Johnson is going to force it because his ego is too big. But at the very least, I have seen it does look like the film is no longer slated to come out next year. That would have been super stupid if they were going to be putting out Moana 2 six months before. It's too much Moana and it's just confl conflict of interest. It would make the whole marketing campaigns for both of them get kind of murky. So push Moana live action uh, at least another year, maybe two, maybe never, maybe just take it off the calendar because I don't think we really need it. Um, someone pointed out that the water would probably look worse in the live action version than it would on screen in the animated and they're right. I have never seen water look so beautiful. Just like how Tangled made ice look beautiful, Moana makes water look beautiful. Especially in that opening scene when Moana's a little girl. Uh, yeah, this is this is a, a story that is so epic and um, kind of straightforward, but also with a great pairing relationship between Maui and Moana that, uh, yeah, it deserves to be acclaimed so high critically. I think most people agree that this is a really strong film. Lin-Manuel Miranda does a great job with the score. I don't personally like the shiny song, but I also love the sequence and I love the crab character. So I think it's still really good. I just think the song is absolutely horrible to listen to, but the crab is also garish and a little bit, you know, un unsightly. So I think it fits the whole aesthetic. 
Um, yeah, I just wish there was more. I think the story kind of rushes through itself. And I feel like the exploration part, it doesn't really feel like Moana's traveled that far to get where she goes. It feels like she went to like two islands and it was like, we're here. We're, we're defeating the, you know, lava monster. And it's like, well, it didn't feel like we went on that long of a journey, but that's where Moana 2 could maybe expand the horizons of the ocean even more. <laughs> Speaking of the ocean, The Little Mermaid is what made Disney as big as it is today. I mean, obviously, Cinderella and Sleeping Beauty, but the company was almost completely dead. And then The Little Mermaid was just like, hello, you know, Alan Menken and Howard Ashman, rest in peace. Howard Ashman, this is his songwriting predominantly. I still need to watch that documentary. Uh, and Ron Clements, Ron Clements and John Musker. Uh, the Little Mermaid uh, is so perfectly executed as a story that, I mean, I have no notes. Um, Ursula is the perfect villain. The sacrifice that Ariel has to make for her man. Now, of course, I do think it was important for the live action version to sort of change those things a little bit. But they made the right, cho they made the right choices in changing them. Um, Sebastian, uh, the whole end conflict. I, I have no notes. Uh, part of your world has been lauded as the absolute best Disney song. And I will disagree. I think there is one stronger, just one though. Part of your world is at least the second strongest. And there is no better Disney I want song. That is the quintessential I want song. And I think that Halle Bailey does a phenomenal job with it. Uh, I'll just briefly state that I do think that after Cinderella, the live action Little Mermaid is perhaps the second or at least third best Disney live action remake. It doesn't exactly improve too much upon the original, but it holds its own. And it has a reason, at least in my mind, to exist. I know some people might not think so, but at least it does to me. And I don't want to hear it about Ariel not being allowed to be Afro-Caribbean. The whole film is, is set in that kind of setting. Sebastian has a Caribbean accent. There's much more coral reef aesthetic. I mean, if you really want to have it by Italy, it just, the, the underwater landscape wouldn't look like that. It very much feels more like it's in the Caribbean. So it makes perfect sense for Ariel to be a person of color. Um, and besides, who cares anyway? It's a mythological creature who has a father who has children all over the sea. So mermaids, it, there's no, there doesn't need to be that kind of logic. <laughs> We get to the top 10. Boy, this video has been so absurdly long. So I'm sorry if I'm brushing through some of these things, but I really cannot spend forever talking about them. And especially a lot of these films, I have redundantly good things to say. It's like, I can't say this film is really good a million different ways, okay? Pinocchio, my favorite part is the clock sequence, but it's more than just that. Pinocchio is a beautiful coming of age tale, dark, uh, probing, commentative about society. Even 80 years from, from its release, it still holds up with the animation and the story. It's just absolutely brilliant and understandably kind of the bedrock of Disney's iconography. When You Wish Upon a Star is in the top five Disney songs. Of course, that theme and motif is used to symbolize the entire company. And I think that was a smart choice. One of the most magical parts about Disney and one of the most magical songs and melodies. Pinocchio is an A+. Alice in Wonderland is a forever childhood favorite of mine that I will always defend for being completely bonkers and nonsensical. Alice in Wonderland is about bonkers and nonsensical things. Alice in Wonderland is meant to be something that is more of a journey than destination. Uh, it is meant to be completely head scratching and a little bit trippy. Uh, I think that the brilliance of this film is how unapologetic it is in stringing together complete nonsense and being beautiful at the same time. The, you know, critiques that people have about it are people not liking that for it. And I say, all right, this movie is just not made for you. And that's okay. I understand you want a stronger narrative. You don't want just like sequences, dream sequences that really kind of don't tie together very well. I don't know what to tell you. 
this movie is brilliant if you want that kind of surrealist fantasia like atmosphere um i mean alice is i feel alice is my disney plus icon you know like i i, I always identify this out <laughs> alice is like the disney character that i always kind of was like that's me i'm alice so i always felt a little bit of a kinship with alice and so that also you know, uh, I will say I was so disappointed in the Tim Burton remake. Um, it's not, you know, unfortunately, the bar is so low. We've gotten so many live action remakes where now I'm almost looking at the original 2010 Alice in Wonderland and going, you know, it's not that bad. It's true. It's maybe the fifth best of the live action remakes, but there's a big dip between three and four and five. It's like, you know, I, I, that Tim Burton version completely Tim Burtonized the story that is not. I don't think Tim Burton was the right person. Um, Johnny Depp is great as the Mad Hatter, but I don't think Tim Burton was the right person to realize the story. Uh, I think it needed someone who was a little less gothic. <laughs> uh, goth, the goth thing is played out in the movie, and Alice in Wonderland is equally bright colors and, and very whimsical, and I feel we lose so much of that in the Tim Burton version. Absolutely love the garden sequence. That's my absolute favorite. Uh, Lilo and Stitch. This is the highest 21st century uh, film. Lilo and Stitch deserved the box office success. It was heavily advertised, which is something Atlantis and Treasure Planet deserved, but whatever. Anyway, Lilo and Stitch, uh, they had a hit on their hands. I guess it was a more merchandisable film because Stitch, you know, who doesn't want to own a plush Stitch in their bedroom? Um, and Stitch is the iconic animal sidekick character. I mean, he, they couldn't have kicked up a better in a lab, a better uh, nonverbal character. I mean, he's somewhat verbal, but, you know, who's somewhat a protagonist. Uh, great Hawaiian representation, great female figure representation. A lot of people have talked about Nani and how for the first time it was like depicting women in Disney with like real bodies, like not necessarily like not like attractive bodies, but like bodies that are a little bit more, you know, sturdy uh, and not so, you know, insanely waif-like uh, and Barbie-esque um, and just really real characters. I think the dialogue just feels so real between all of the characters. And then you've got uh, Bubbles, the uh, social worker, um, the iconic moment where she is... My friends need to be punished. I mean, it's just so many gr brilliant humorous scenes and so many things to dissect with this film. I won't go into it too much more detail. All I'll say is that it, this is a beautiful uh, Elvis, Tribley, Elvis Presley tribute. I mean, the Elvis stuff is a little heavy handed, but I, you know, the family loved Elvis. That, that's, that's just a fun extra little layer to the cake. Um, but, you know, for all that this movie is silly and light, it still has a really heavy kind of subject matter that about family and losing parents. And I mean, it does everything right. Again, sort of like Frozen, there's something for everyone and it checks off every box, box. Even though it's not a musical, it has some great musical sequences by some, some, some Hawaiian chorus groups. And those carry, I wish there was more of them in the film. Those really stand out. Sleeping Beauty is the perfect Disney fairy tale. I feel like they perfected everything that they were working on with Snow White and Cinderella into Sleeping Beauty. They finally gave us a prince who has a speaking role and somewhat of a personality, even though he completely loses it for the last 30 minutes of the film. But he's busy fighting dragons, okay? And then Maleficent is just fully realized as this, what, what the, you know, evil queen was kind of potential. We finally get that in Maleficent. Uh, and then the fairy godmother in Cinderella is now three and much more personality imbued in the three fairies, Flora, Fauna, and Meriwether. Um, their campers, their scant antics in the kitchen as a kid was my absolute favorite thing to watch. Uh, it still is one of my favorite parts of the film. But besides the absolutely majestic, beautiful music, I mean, Once Upon a Dream will never leave your head once it enters it, and for good reason. The animation style is so 
thought out, um, so lofty in its kind of uh, inferences and reference. And Earl, who uh, his paintings and work and was used in the backdrops of Cinder uh, Sleeping Beauty, really elevates and separates out this film from the rest. Uh, it wouldn't have been the same without that sort of animation and illustrative style. Um, it adds so much character and flavor, uh, so much uh, depth, uh, even though it's somewhat of a 2D kind of illustrative style, the depth is still there. Um, the, the storybook wonder of the forests and the richness and the textures of it are all there. It's just so beautiful. This is the other film that there are certain scenes that I would love to have as paintings on my wall because they are just so beautifully realized with such a unique point of view and perspective on how to depict uh, whimsical illustration. Um, so all in all, I, I mean, yeah, Aurora is probably the missing link. She's the weakest part of the film. But, you know, it's the 1950s and, you know, the blonde damsel in distress archetype is running rampant. What are you going to do? I forgive the film the fact that Aurora is not the strongest female protagonist, uh, that she doesn't have a lot of agency in her own life or in her own decisions. It's the night. It's, it's a dated kind of depiction, but it, it's part and parcel of the package that you're getting. And I still have an affinity for it. So what can I say? Sleeping Beauty is absolute elegance it's it's very uh, very much channeling what the uh the tchaikovsky ballet is giving in music form on screen they do a great job at like, keeping that sort of sophisticated regality on screen that i think the film deserves it's like it's the kind of film you feel like you have to have upright posture to watch you can't be slouching it's just so polished the lines and the symmetry everything is is just absolutely exquisite <laughs> Mulan is one of the more modern takes on a Disney heroine. I think it was groundbreaking at the time to have a character like Mulan gender bend so openly in a time where, you know, conservatives are coming for Disney for being woke and trans people are finding rights being stripped away from them before we even really get, they even really got a chance to have any to begin with. Mulan was an important cultural moment. Um, especially for Chinese culture. Uh, but of course, Mulan, that, you know, Disney's just co-opting the story. It's not like they came up with it. But I do think that Mulan did a lot stronger what Pocahontas kind of failed to do, which was representation that really compounded into positive PR for the company. Um, Mulan is just one of the most important bits of representation for female Disney characters that I think you can find. And that what frustrates me so much about the Disney live action version is it strips away so much of what makes Mulan such a compelling female protagonist. And it turns her into a Marvel superhero. And it takes away a lot of the inherent feminism of the film, I believe, when you do that. And so I was so, so deeply disappointed with the Mulan 2020 version that I it, it bothers me to talk about it. Plus, there were a lot of other issues with the film. I'm not going to get into it. I will at one point rank all the Disney live action movies. I just don't have time for that. But all I'm going to say is that uh, Mushu is also a big part of the story. And she and he does his thing. Eddie, Eddie Murphy knows how to bring these sidekick characters to life. Uh, similarly to what he does with, Sh with Shrek. And of course, Jerry Goldsmith really does a great job. Jerry Goldsmith gives Alan Menken a run for his money. I'm like, none of these other wannabe Alan Menkens are doing a great job. But Jerry Goldsmith, they only worked with him for one movie, but he did a good job. Um, so, I mean, you know, Tony Bancroft and Barry Cook also only ever worked on this movie. I wish they'd done more for Disney. I think they were really cooking. Mulan has everything. It also stops being a musical halfway through. And I think that's a brilliant way to do it. It's a great bridge between old and new kind of Disney. Because it's like, suddenly this is very serious. The Huns have come and killed this village. The fun, the fun and games are over. And if, even though the movie is serious throughout, I love the scene where she chops her hair off. The music, I wish it was on the soundtrack. I don't understand why, but the sort of more up-tempo scoring is just not included on the original soundtrack. So sh such a shame. Um, at the risk of this video not getting too long, everything is awesome about this movie. <laughs> uh, this is just, this is one of those movies that I'm like, someone's like, what's a good, they've never seen a Disney movie. What's one they should see? I'd be like, have you seen Mulan? Okay, 
So now we come to the top five. Let me make one thing very clear. These top five films could all interchangeably and easily be made a case for the best film of Disney's catalog. I ultimately had to decide which one I felt was the strongest, and this is how it ended up breaking down. But I would understand putting when putting any of these top five, even these top ten, as the best. Fantasia is high art. Fantasia transcends the corporatism of Disney. I talk about it a little bit in the Fantasia 2000, but it is the progenitor of what that was to be. There are, I believe, nine or eight sequences, some longer, some shorter. Uh, we have the Pastoral Symphony by, by Beethoven, depicting Greek um, uh, bacchanalia in Greek mythology with fauns and centaurs. We have the origin story of geology on this planet going through creation of the planet to the dinosaurs and the Rite of Spring by Stravinsky. We have music represented by Takata and Fugue uh, in a very symbolic way. We have um, the Nutcracker sequence, which takes some of my absolute favorite scores of classical music of all time and sequences them to beautiful animation of nature scenes, which I just, every time I watch, especially in high definition, I just marvel at like what I'm seeing, especially since this came out, you know, 80 years ago. I just, I'm just, I'm just like absolutely floored by it. And then we have the finale, where we have uh, the most raw, I mean, talk about a movie should be reading PG. The, the sequence, Night on Bald Mountain, is the, the, depicting this giant devil called Chernabog on this mountain, who is conducting basically like puppets, all of these tormented souls from hell. If you thought that was from a Disney movie, you'd be like, what? I mean, this is... This is where I feel like Disney could have potentially like become a more interesting company, but they ultimately chose like family friendly content, but they weren't sure at the time, you know, they were really like, I don't know, like we're always going to somewhat appeal to families, but we're also like looking for niche things here too. Uh, and if, if Disney had gone into horror, that would have been really interesting, but this is the closest we're ever going to get. We see the contrast of dark and light so starkly illustrated here and so wondrously illustrated when we seek into the Franz Schubert rendition of Ave Maria. And we have these angels uh, going from dawn into the sunrise. So it's sort of like the early hours of, of the sun rising and we see this sequence. And the first time I saw it sort of as an adult, because as a kid, I didn't really watch Fantasia. It just wouldn't have really resonated with me at the time. I feel like I don't think I actually ever saw it, or at least not all of it. I think I saw The Sorcerer's Apprentice, which is, is great, which I repeat is in the 19 and the 2000 version as well. That's another highlight part of it, of course. You got to have Mickey in, in there somewhere. But... Um, I wouldn't have appreciated it as a child. This is one of those few Disney movies that I think requires being an adult to view. And that's what's so unique about this film. And it is why it is praised as like a high art film of piece of cinema that you might not necessarily always equate Disney animation with. Illumination could never. DreamWorks could never. Okay, old school Disney animation was just on another level. And the idea behind this entire this is just, yeah, this is just absolutely spellbinding stuff. You've got to see it to believe it. Highly recommend if you haven't. Uh, it's on another level. A lot of people put The Lion King at number one. Listen, in the interest of brevity, I'm going to summarize my Lion King review by saying that this film is quintessential viewing for everyone, a universal movie that everyone can find something to grasp onto, Beautifully animated, beautifully scored. Hans Zimmer, I mean, I mentioned how Jerry Goldsmith was the only one who came up to Alan Menken's level, but Hans Zimmer was, you know, doing his thing. I think Hans Zimmer was the perfect choice for the score. Um, every single song, even Hakuna Matata, even though I, I, I roll my eyes at that one just because it is so juvenile in some ways. Uh, but this whole film is just, it is art. And it deserved the Academy Award nominations. I would have been perfectly fine 
and thinking and justified if this had won Best Picture, um, but it didn't, similar to the other film I'm about to talk about. Either of these films, had they won, I think it would have been justified. Uh, but, you know, we all remember where we were when we first saw Mufasa fell, similar to the Bambi situation, but they just expound on the kind of animal story. Like, this is one of the only Disney animated movies that doesn't have any humans in it. Bambi is the other one. And they're such great bookends to see where how far Disney has come. Bambi was like just playing in the forest with animals and wonderful animation. But this is like, we're now a full, like we know how to create really amazing stories with epic music and really expensive, but well hand-drawn animated stuff. The opening sequence is the best opening sequence of all, not only Disney animated films, but all animated films, potentially all films in general. Uh, that's old, but I think that Circle of Life Steve sequence is, bar none, probably the best opening of any film. Aladdin is, uh, again, Ron Clements and John Musker finding their footing as being just amazing adventure Disney years. Um, immaculate scoring, again, Alan Menken does his thing. Uh, beautiful animation, Robin Williams is genie. Dare I say any more? Like, do I really need to harp on about how amazing this film is? We've all seen it. Uh, I would have given this a Best Picture nomination at the Oscars, but it didn't end up getting one. But it's the other one I would have given. Well, one other as well. Uh, and uh, yeah, Aladdin is 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 almost perfect. I mean, there's so many great things about it. Again, if you put it at number one, I wouldn't. I would be like, yeah, I understand. Um, I think it's also the closest, I mean, it's the most different sort of representation we've seen in the Dis Disney film, the, the Middle East. Uh, I would really like to see Disney adapt India in this sort of story, uh, in a sort of fairy tale, epic Disney story. I, we have not seen that yet. The, the Jungle Book was technically set in India, but it was, it was more kind of just neat. It was, it was not so much about Indian culture and civilization. The Hunchback of Notre Dame is so adult in how it's portrayed that, again, as a Disney movie, it's almost too dark for children. I remember watching it as a kid because we did own it on VHS. And, you know, at the time, perhaps I still kind of felt like, well, this isn't Aladdin. This isn't The Lion King. But now I see it for how brilliant it is and represent, you know, understand a little more the heavy themes, even though I understood them as a kid. And uh, I think this film, what makes this film so strong is that it doesn't talk down to children about the evils of the world. Um, I think that it's kind of, uh, unfortunately, I feel like we see in the current direction of Disney um, uh, a, 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 a trepidation to make anything potentially edgy or dark for children. And Disney has really, really tried to steer away from that. And unfortunately, I do believe that Bob Iger is the reason we are never going to see a live action Hunchback of Notre Dame remake. There was hope that this was happening. It was starting to get off the ground, but then those rumors, those kind of um, ideas seem to be thrown aside. And now it does seem like it never say never, but I'd be very surprised if it were to end up happening. And of course I would be worried that it would not be good. I mean, the Hunchback of Notre Dame two is a terrible movie. So if they can mess that up, they could easily mess up the live action. Uh, this has gobsmacking animation, gobsmacking depictions of Notre Dame Cathedral, absolutely um, god tier animation and music musical storytelling. Storytelling, uh, a story that is mature, that is dark, but also something kids can latch onto and feel seen in. It's the best of both worlds, and Claude Frollo is truly a menacing evil character. Um, a sadistic, twisted, perverted character. And that's not something you get explored so, you know, overtly. Especially with Hellfire, that song is the scariest and hardest song Disney's ever done. I mean, you know, the Chernabog sequence isn't really a song, it's set to classical music. This is a scripted, scored song by Alan Menken, and it is absolutely diabolical and it deserves to be so because it is a glimpse into the time period you know 15th century france uh 14th century france i forget which time period it's exactly set in 
this is the kind of thinking you're up against. And it makes the film feel so real. It makes you feel like you're really watching a live action version that just happens to be animated because it is so realistically hand-drawn, so beautifully animated that all the characters, their emotions are so visceral on their face. You, 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 it blurs the line. And that's what a good animated film should do. The Prince of Egypt is another one that does the same thing for me. Uh, that's a DreamWorks film that, you know, would have deservedly been a high on this if it was from Disney. My favorite song of all time from Disney that's not Feed the Birds from Mary Poppins, because that's technically live action, is God Help the Od God Help the Outcasts, sung by Esmeralda in this film. Also because of the sequence of her singing it in the cathedral, but I just think it is the most haunting and stirring melody, the most, uh, most heart-wrenching lyricism, the most poignant lyricism, the most uh, universal lyricism that everyone can see themselves in. Disney, it, it's just miles and miles above the kind of uh, lofty songwriting we see from the kind of the heavy religious spiritual subject matter that this Disney often strays from. This film has a lot of religious undertones that it doesn't shy away from. And that's why I said it makes it feel very real and um, very, uh, very visceral. Oh, and I will, I'll just address everyone's one complaint about this film is the gargoyles. I will agree that the gargoyles drag a little bit and their song is the weakest of all the songs. But again, I do think having a little bit for everyone is important in a Disney film. And so in having a guy like you in that whole sequence with the gargoyles lightens things up a little bit for children. And I do think that that's important. Maybe having that balance is, 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 is important. But some people say the gargoyles really bring it down. I do think that it is a shame that you think the gargoyles are completely a, a figment of Quasimodo's imagination until the end when you see the gargoyles actually interact with Claude Frollo and other characters and you realize that they're real and you're sort of like, oh, this film would have made so much more thematic sense if Quasi had always imagined them as his best friends and they were this just, you know, statues he was talking to would pep himself up, um, you know, but I forgive that. It is a Disney film after all. At number one, what else could it have been? Beauty and the Beast is the creme de la creme of what Disney has to offer. Uh, the overall best package of score and music, even though I think there are better songs than other movies, this one overall is the most cohesively strong, the most richly and beautifully animated. I got this on 4K and I was just gobsmacked at like all of the stained glass and all of the castle detail and the, the illustration of the landscape. And I was just like, oh, this is so beautiful. This is high art. Beauty and the Beast should have won Best Picture. I'm sorry to Silence of the Lambs, but it should have gone to Beauty and the Beast. It should have gone to Beauty and the Beast. That year it was nominated. It had its best shot of probably winning. The only shot of an animated film. If Beauty and the Beast cannot win for Best Picture for animation, I'm not entirely sure any animated film ever will. Because I do wonder when an animated film will ever take home that award at the Oscars. And I'm just not sure. I'm just not sure. Uh, but this was a box office success, a critical success. Um, it was a success on every front and, uh, you, you can't go wrong with it. Um, I, I don't know what else to say. I, I really loved the sequence where she went in the West Wing as a child. It was just so haunting and mysterious and frightening. And it did a great job at like showing how uh, frightening this whole character, this whole kind of setting was for Belle. I think Belle is definitely one of the more relatable and um, one of the Disney heroines I have more of an affinity for. I do not think it's Stockholm Syndrome. I think the film makes it very clear that she chooses to come back uh, because she starts to develop feelings. And um, you know, that's not the be all end all of the conversation, but there's going to be some things you can nitpick and critique, but this video has gotten so long. <laughs> I cannot believe this is the longest video I'm ever going to make for this channel. And I'm glad I did it, but oh my God, it's just so much. And I had to film it over three separate days because it was just too much filming. What are your favorite Disney films? Do you agree with my list? Like I said, those top 10 could have any one of those, you're being your number one, totally would understand. Like even the top 15. Uh, but I'd be curious to know what your favorites, what your least favorites were, what your thoughts are on these movies. 
I'm really excited to see where Disney animation can go, but I'm going to be honest with you. Strange World, Wish, the track record it's had has made me a little worried. I do think that Jennifer Lee is probably going to leave Disney Animation as its head. I think that that's probably best. Uh, and I really hope that these sequels are, you know, worthwhile. I hope that they're, you know, not just cash grabs that we realize have no merit and no reason for existing. That seems to be a problem that Disney's been having for quite some time. So we shall see. Uh, but I will rank the live action versions of all these movies at, at a future point, maybe a year from now um, or at some point. And then I will do a similar video for Pixar. And uh, I, yeah, I, I just, I love Disney for all its faults. I will always, you know, have an affinity for the magic and what makes it special. And uh, the magic that will always be intrinsically attached to childhood and that is something that I think is is really beautiful and special in cinema. So um, don't sleep on media that's made for kids that, you know, doesn't have potentially stronger reasons for existing. Kids entertainment can be artful entertainment. It can be magical entertainment. Um, and that's why I kind of defend it a little bit. Uh, so yeah, thank you all so much for watching. I hope you all enjoyed. Please give this a like if you did. Subscribe for more content. I talk about movies and music, mostly music, but I will be talking more about movies on this channel. And again, thank you all so much for watching. I will see you all in my next video. Peace, love, and light. Bye.